I remember I checked to Jack about this on WhatsApp ages ago, where I do think you could actually create like a daily stoic of midwit memes because it's so easy to fall into this trap. One yeah. of the ideas I came up with of like a little like razor or rule of thumb to myself is, well, I stopped trying to be the genius. It's like, how can I just turn this into the guy on the left? So if I'm if I can never basically say it in the words of the guy on the left, I've definitely overcomplicated my existence. And I, I don't know why, I mean, it's open to you guys, but there's something about complexity that makes you think you're smart. By dumbing it down, you're making it smarter. And that's a weird, I mean, Jack's probably can chat about this from a design perspective, but it's a weird paradox that I constantly go through and it's only at the other end of it do I realize I should have gone for the dumbed down approach to begin with. All right, welcome to another episode of Not Investment Advice. We've got Jack Butcher, Trung Fan, Bilal Zaidi, the NI gang back together as always. And we've got a very, very special guest, George Mack. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for having us. I've been a fan and a listener since the first ever episode. So it's good to be, oh, here good we to be go. on the other Look side. I can't wait for episode two so we can say Return of the Mac. One of the greatest songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Is Return I missed of the that wait, one. Nice. How, do you ever joke about Return of the Mac or is this just like the North American thing? It's so funny you've said that. I've looked at that domain name, returnofthemac.com, numerous times, considered it for a newsletter as well. So yeah, no, I, you know how I absolutely good that, love that song. song is? Oh, that's a classic. That Rafa, can you cut the chorus for the songs right now? <laughs> it's so good, man. That, dude, yeah, I was demonetized uh, before we monetize, but actually, yeah, no, it's, a it's a classic. I got a, I just read something which you guys appreciate. You guys remember Sean Paul, right? Of mm, course. course. So mm. the New York Times Paul. just did a profile about Sean Paul, and the reason they did it was he's huge on TikTok now. Like 20 year olds are discovering him. And there's a quote in the article, which will make guys laugh so hard. It's relevant to return the Mac. There's like a high school kid. He's like, I'm so sad that this song wasn't out when I was in high school. Cause it's all about grinding and getting laid. Right. So I'm not saying that's what return of the Mac is about. <laughs> grinding. Just... <laughs> the different sort of grinding, not, yeah. not like Gary Vee grinding. We're talking yeah. about old yeah. school. Grinding yeah. in the nineties is very different Jack than what we Cardiff see on tech grinding. Twitter. Mm. There we yeah. go. Yeah, it's a different, different era. But George, we were just talking before the show. Uh, so you're currently back in the UK, but you're, you're where are you normally based? Are you allowed to, are you talking about it? So what? What's the situation? Yeah, yeah, no, a little bit, a little bit all over the place. I left the UK during COVID. Uh, spent uh, quite a lot of time in Dubai, a lot of time in a little, well, a little bit of time in America, a little bit of time in Europe, and back home seeing the parents right now. So I'm a little bit. I don't know if they have the term trung where you are. There's like this term of champagne socialist in the UK, which is someone who preaches <laughs> socialistic values, but then just but doesn't live. live. I'm, yeah, I'm very much champagne homeless right now. I'm a little bit all over the place, but living good. <laughs> living a good well, life, yeah, mate. Have it, just like Elon that uh, doesn't have any homes and then just crashing at his boys' mansions. Pretty much. Exactly. exactly. But And then George, so you're originally from UK, like Jack and I. We got Trung, our resident Canadian here, but how's it to be back home, mate? Is it, you You had a kebab yet? Been to Nando's? What's what's the situation? <laughs> I, I have been to Nando's. That is the first thing I do when I get back. First I mean, stop. The, yeah, the UK, I you can't, one thing I've learned about the UK, interested to get Jack and Bilal's opinion on this, is there's, I wrote an essay a while ago about the UK versus the US and there's the nuances and the differences there. When I explored the US, I began to see them quite a lot. But the one thing you don't get anywhere else is the sense of humor. So even things like wherever yeah. I'm in the world, if you meet a service person and you ask them a question, they'll give you a straight answer. The other day in the UK, I met a service person. I go, hey, mate, do you know the directions to X, Y, Z? And he goes, you're at the completely wrong airport. And like, I thought my heart starts going like that. And he goes, <laughs> just fucking you, mate. It's over there. And it's just a, couple, a stranger I've never met before. And I, I love the, the, straight uh, face, the yeah. humor that exists in, in the UK. It's different. I love that's the thing I miss the most. Is, is Ricky Gervais representative of this deadpan type of humor? It's like, is, 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 or is he a little his own thing? Is you know that what's a fair thing to say? Oh, sorry, that was a question for George, I know, but you know how many people I know that base their entire personality on the first two seasons of The Office? Like, they got downloaded <laughs> the firmware, basically, of Gervais in <laughs> The Office, and that created a generation of young men that tried to be, like, even probably the cadence of how I talk now, is based on reciting and learning episodes of The Office verbatim. Yeah, like was, was Ali G on that level? Was Ali G on that level? We're gonna level talk about too, this. Yeah, so, like, in a different we, way. we need to go down this. Uh, to, uh, let's go down this rabbit hole. So, Jack, there's a whole generation of people obsessed in England with Ricky Gervais, right? 
What about Ali yeah, G? Specifically, so the I... office. I think Ali G yeah. was like a, maybe a little bit too cartoonish. Like, okay. like definitely. You weren't trying to like, be like him. You were just he had the catchphrases, him. and it was in culture. And people, but the Gervais thing, for whatever reason, just became this ridiculous level of emulation where you're like, people would talk to their relatives that way. It's like you're not even doing it as a joke between one another. You've like taken it on a entirely different level. I'm sure people have written about this, but I was actually talking to Celia about this the other day. It was like that guy, the influence that guy had on, on a very specific set of people at a very specific time was just enormous. The, the crazy thing about Gervais, Trung, I don't know if you've been down a, like a full Gervais rabbit hole, but I, I have this list of like 0.1% of ideas I've collected. And the only thing in there that's comedic is Ricky Gervais, Steve and Merchant and Carl Pilkinson, hundreds of hours they did on the radio. But there's oh, so yeah. many things you get from Gervais. So the first thing about Gervais is in his 20s, he was a musician. He was obsessed with David Bowie. And you can find these old photos of Gervais. And he's like, he's a, a very good looking dude. And he had a few number ones in like Eastern Europe, toured around. He was like Ooh. almost on the edge Four of getting Breaking conclusion. Through. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. yeah like, cause, and then you see his character, Brent, who obviously plays the guitar. So he was a failed musician. He then basically gave up on that, was miserable in an office throughout his 30s. And that's where he came up with the idea of the office. Boom. Essentially, he did the one small show on Channel 4, then straight office, huge blockbuster hit. Um, and it's even like small stuff of like how he hired Stephen Merchant because he was on the radio and he just picked the first like CV that got handed to him and went, yeah, he'll do. And that was Stephen Merchant, obviously, as his writer. And then even Carl Pilkington, he was just a random producer that they gave to him. And if you go back and listen to the first time they ever meet on the radio, it's them talking. And yeah, Gervais's career is just bizarre, but... Well, that's, yeah, that's... Pilkington as well is like one in a trillion, that guy. Like how, how well, they got you... paired up is just mental. Have you guys seen An Idiot Abroad? J I love this it. Is, there's a I show called An Idiot, An Idiot Abroad and it's Carl Pilkington. This guy is like a bald-headed guy and it's Ricky Gervais and is the third guy uh, who just said... Uh, Merchant. I forgot. Merchant, yeah. Steve Merchant. Steve Merchant. And it's basically Carl Pilkington, who's this kind of like simple English guy and they sent... It's like a travel show, but they send him to like the Great Wall of China and then he's just there and he's just this like hilarious guy, but just he's so simple and he's just, like eating a packet of crisps, like watching, looking at the Great Wall of China. It's like, is that it sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. And it's just this refreshing. <laughs> it's such a funny show, man. It's so well, good. I want to say something because George, I did, the one thing I did have about, I don't have this point one ideas, but the one thing I always had in my brain about Ricky Gervais is what you said though. I'm not the music with the office stuff. Cause I remember being in an office after university. I'm like, I fucking hate this. I want to be a comedy writer. And I'm like, Oh my God, Ricky Gervais didn't start till he was 39. I got like 15 more years. We're getting pretty close to like that coming up on time. But like, I remember seeing that and that actually like, it inspired me just not to give up on life, like essentially, right? Like this guy was like 39 years old before he hit it big. I didn't know about the music career though. So that, that oh, he obviously put in certain reps as an entertainer. You know what's fun? I mean, there's something there about older comedians too. Uh, Seinfeld, uh, Larry Seinfeld David. Seinfeld was 38 when he started like the show, yeah. a certain amount of life experience to be that funny for that amount of time maybe. Like that's, there's something interesting there. One of my favorite clips recently I saw was it's Theo Vaughn and Louis C.K. talking. And Louis oh, found Theo Vaughn relatively amazing. recently. And he, he just says to him, he goes, um, he goes, he goes, so where are you at right now? And he goes, and he says something like, I'm at the 20, I'm 21 years in. He goes, ah, he goes, yeah, the 20th year is when you really begin to get good. <laughs> and it's like, that is just a it's different ridiculous. frame of reference. Yeah, that's mad. Incredible. That's mad. Well, George, I realize we're uh, we're in a little while. We haven't even fully introduced you, by the way, just for people. Like, we mentioned you on the show probably at least once a month. So real quick, though, who who are you, man? Like, because for people who don't actually know who you are, why do we invite you on the show, dude? It's a good question. I've been writing online for a while around numerous different questions, ideas that come into my head. Um, and just, yeah, like uh, my obsession is trying to think about where things are going, uh, both at the individual level, the societal level, um, and then kind of packaging that up. I, my whole background is from like a marketing lens as well. So I look at things for, often from a marketing perspective too. But yeah, that's that's myself. Love it. But you're, so, you're, you're a tech entrepreneur also, right? Like you're involved in tech? 
Yeah, I have a marketing agency that I've run for quite a while and look after a whole host of different Y Combinator companies, lots of companies that are scaling very aggressively online. So, okay, smashing perfect. it. Smashing so, it, let's, mate. let's, uh, how long have you been writing online? I remember when we chat like six months ago, you had, you, you've been writing online a long time, but you're getting really into it. You said something about it to me about uh, 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 infinite games and finite games and why you mm. wanted to write a lot on the internet again. Yeah, I've never spoken about this. Um, the, what happened to me is I started writing quite early on and that's probably when I got to know Jack a little bit and then Trung, I remember yourself coming onto the scene and I disappeared for a little while for a few reasons. One, I wanted, I was inspired by Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography of him kind of getting rich and then he could do his own like artistic thing. So that was kind of a thing that always hit home with me. But the realization I had was I was in the Maldives, beautiful location if anybody's ever been. It's the most like amazing location. And I'd wake up and I'd want to write. And I said, like, shit, okay, so I'm in the Maldives. I'm in the best location possible. And all I want to do is write. And then I had a flashback to when I was younger and I was at Warehouse Project in Manchester, which Jack and Bilal probably will know. It's yeah, a there, crazy yeah, rave. But yeah, with lots of substances and supplements going on uh, from all sorts of different things. And whilst everybody's there raving, I'm writing down ideas on my phone. When I was back in nightclubs, I'd try and escape just to write down ideas on my phone. So I was like, hold on. I go, realistically, this is something that I'm going to be doing for 70 to 80 years. So that's kind of what inspired largely my return and why I'm writing quite aggressively. Well, I have to say the writing notes in a nightclub, that's kind of weird, dude. <laughs> Wait, I, I get bored. <laughs> I get bored, man. I just pop off. If I'm at the bar and I'm thinking over this dude's like Arnold Schwarzenegger life tips, I'm like, yo, bro. Ideas that sound crazy today. (laughs) It'd be more like, it'd be more, I'd be on maybe uh, different things and I'd be like thinking about ideas that'd be coming through and I'd I'd pop off. I'd get bored of nightclubs, man. I was so glad that I could retire from nightclubs about a year ago because it's not for me. Okay, so you're out the nightclub game. You're no longer taking, you're no longer reading a Kindle and like have taken notes in the nightclub. <laughs> do you get no. that thing when you're at nightclubs? When you know it's like uh, obviously you got to do this when you're single, but you're obviously there to have a good time and uh, probably pick up. But you're not having the greatest time ever. You're, you're not getting much success, so you just pretend like you you're on the phone. Whereas you're just actually going in the corner and like pretending to text someone. Just looking at your phone. phone. You're, just, you're just so awkward. You're just we like, oh man, there, uh, this is boring. Like, hey man. Anyways, man, that, that, <laughs> that reminded me of George like taking notes, but he actually was taking notes on his phone. No, I mean, yeah. So that's when I realized as a writer, just from that experience alone. Um, and I was going, okay, hold whenever I want to get bored, that's all I want to do. So if I'm bored in a fucking nightclub because of shit all going on, to be honest, strong, it's mainly nightclubs in the north of England and not the prettiest things as some of the boys will attest to. Um, but yeah, so that's when I was like, okay, let's take this a lot more serious over the last kind of six months or so. Love it. Love it. Should we should we get into some of the, the topics you've been writing about then, mate? Because uh, we've got so many to cover, but... Um, this one kind of stood out to me. You shared a bunch of these before. I think the midwit meme guide to life was very NIA. I don't know if you want to start with that, but there's a bunch we could go with. Uh, we didn't actually do a meme in a week, but this could be a whole topic on meme in a week. So uh, I'm just going to share Fired my up. screen here. So yeah, tell us a little bit about this, mate. I think in the text you said something <laughs> about midwit memes are better than life coach. So uh, you basically got a whole like a collection of these here. Yeah, the reason uh, I create, I mean, everybody's seen this, right? Like the the midwit meme. And I think it as somebody who's a mid himself, a recovering mid or constantly a mid each day, um, this is one of the reasons why I came behind this. And I, I've, I remember I checked to Jack about this on WhatsApp ages ago, where I do think you could actually create like a daily stoic of midwit memes because it's so easy to fall into this trap one yeah. of the ideas i came up with of like a little like razor or rule of thumb to myself is well i stopped trying to be the genius it's like how can i just turn this into the guy on the left so if i'm if i can never basically say it in the words of the guy on the left i've definitely overcomplicated my existence yeah we need to read this first one off let's give people an idea of what this mid. Myth- Okay, actually, George, you should explain what the midwit uh, midwit meme is for people. First of all, just so we know that we're yeah. on the same page here. All right, so the what mid- is this meme? The midwit meme is it's like the IQ bell curve from fifty five to one forty five. You've got the Jedi on the right. You've got the loot, like the kind of 
simpleton on the left, shall we say. And then you've got the kind of reply guy in the middle who is constantly trying to over-intellectualize everything. And the genius and the simple person often come to the same conclusion. So on this one here, the guy in the middle uh, chatting about business is, let's combine the MBA with a five-year stint in consulting and the whole TED Talk business library. The business idea I'll end up with will be unstoppable. And then the two guys on the left are just make something people want or the guy on the right make something people want. So it's essentially just at the either end of the bell curve, they come to the same conclusion. And you see, I mean, you, you're the fucking king of memes, Trung, but memes often come and go. But this meme is almost like the office of memes. It's like the Gervais of memes. It's still sticking around. And I think it will stick around for a long, long time. You have another one here, which is uh, the midwit guide to weight loss. So guy in the middle is well what makes this diet differently to the other 12 as i've tried is that it leverages superfood fat burning optimization time windows let me send you the six hour podcast and then the guy on the left and the guy on the right are just calories in calories out calories in calories out so it's just the that was butchered a couple of years ago down. by the way that yeah, was jacked like 2018 yeah <laughs> But wait, do, i see this in real life a lot like i reference this order not just this example but just you're, you're talking to someone about a topic and you can hear them going down and I'm 100% being guilty of this as well. But you, it is really a funny but smart observation that like there's there's literally, you could do this every day, like you said. Like you, the next one, trust your gut. Next one, note taking. I mean, the note taking one is brilliant because that is literally like we've all had that. <laughs> like mine is Evernote <laughs> for those Apple Notes. But basically the middle one is like, read wise apple notes i'm gonna like highlight everything and then you realize like no i just need somewhere to write the shit down you know so yeah there's there i mean again we could go through every single one of these but yeah the idea was like don't overcomplicate it here yeah it's yeah it's that simple and i i don't know why i mean it's open to you guys but there's something about complexity that makes you think you're smart mm. but often the case you're by dumbing it down you're making it smarter and that's a weird, I mean, Jack's probably can chat about this from a design perspective, but it's a weird paradox that I constantly go through. And it's only at the other end of it do I realize I should have gone for the dumbed down approach to begin with. Yeah, it's like a coping mechanism or people hide in complexity. You know, Nobody wants to stop talking either. It's awkward to leave a gap in conversation. So <laughs> I'm feeling so awkward as we speak, no, Jack. Dude, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. You ever done no, any like sales so training? Awkward, that's exactly it. The pause, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just like I, I've finished. I've said what I'm trying to say. I wrote this because uh, just got <laughs> to fill the silence now. I wrote, I fucked with Jim O'Shaughnessy once on a podcast when he asked me about this essay I wrote. So it's an essay about I called it Elon time. And do you remember when Elon did that interview with Lex? And Lex asks him a question and he pauses for about 21 seconds. And everybody listening to that podcast checked whether the sound was still playing or whether the internet's yeah. cut off. Um, but I wrote a little, and Jim asked me that question. I purposely paused like Jack then for about eight seconds just to fuck with Jim. And then he started wondering whether the Zoom had cut off. But um, the one thing I took away from when Elon does that specifically was there's almost a costly signaling theory to it as well, where when Elon stops for like 18 seconds, the fact that he's paused and he's thinking about it makes the answer he's about to produce seem more smart as well because everybody else needs to speak so fast and get it out so damn fast like this. Whereas the fact that he can take so much time to think about it, it's almost like when Hormozy released that book recently, he's talking about, I spent two years, 500 hours into this book. Elon's sitting and pausing for 18 seconds in a culture where everybody speaks so damn fast and needs to get things out, actually acts as this weirdly costly signaling mechanism. Yeah, no, dude, I love that. And uh, I don't know if you guys listen to Walter Isaacson and Lex, but Walter Isaacson talks about it all the time. It's, it's really it's a, quite a famous journalism technique. I'd never heard it from the sales perspective, Jack. But there's like, yeah, if you're a reporter, just don't say anything. Let people fill the gap. He's just like, Walter Isaacson is just like, people love to talk. Just don't say anything. Just like, ask a question and they'll fill all the silent spaces because exactly like Jack said, it is so, dude, that three seconds, I was like, oh God, Bilal, please say something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sales is like the first person to speak loses. You ever heard that? It's like Before? a negotiation almost. Yeah. You make yeah. a proposition and then you just quiet. And they're expecting you to just keep talking to make, you know, to fill the air, to make everybody feel comfortable. And you just be quiet. Say what you're saying. What's the related thing? Don't sell past the close. Like if you've already sold it, like just shut the fuck right. up, right? Yeah, just right. shut up. Like yeah, the guy's yeah. already don't agreed. Keep like, selling, don't yeah. keep going. 
Yeah, there's no, some. There's some. I I had. There's a guy called Kevin Kelly, but not the Kevin Kelly. A guy who worked in recruiting. I think I saw speak once, and gave this speech that the timing of it was so remarkable. Like the content of it you'd heard before, but just the ability to say the thing and just be quiet, wait 20 seconds and then say something again, the conviction that it signals in what you're saying is so much higher than rambling to try and fill the time. What, one question I have for you guys, um, I wrote about this a while ago, which is I when I started doing podcasts and I would listen to myself back it was fucking excruciating. And the gap between what I thought I sounded like and what I actually sounded like was huge. And I began to realize, well, first off, it's proof that the 10,000 hour rule is absolutely bollocks because everybody speak, everybody has done their 10,000 hours speaking, but nobody is super charismatic. Um, it's only when you have that iterative loop of hearing yourself back do you begin to realize how strange it is. And uh, Bilal, we were chatting about before the pod of, the what ideas um will sound crazy sound crazy today or weird today but will be obvious kind of 10 to 20 years from now and i do wonder when you have people doing voice memos people doing zoom meetings people hearing their own voice back the same way instagram made to make people think about how they look will this podcast format make people more in tune or more vain about how they sound interesting yeah what, you know, another was, another analogy to that is um, the Twitter. Not so true anymore. But when the character ex the character limit existed, that took me from not really being. I wouldn't describe myself as a great writer before I discovered Twitter because I had to like put an idea in every mm. box and it changed the way you think. It's not like looking at an A4 page and be like, "What am I trying to say here?" It's I have to finish this thought, press send, and then I append that thought with another thought that builds on the premise that I've already secured somehow. And even now when I'm stuck, I can't write something outside of that format. I'll just get like typefully up and just go in the one tweet at a time. I mean, it's like such a huge unlock to have that constraint. That chunk at a time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But George, to answer your, uh, to add to what you said earlier about the listening, like, from um, doing interviews with people, like the number one thing I've got better at is telling them up front, when you listen to this, you're not going to like your voice. Because like 99% of people, I think I heard it on Tim Ferriss or someone who's done a thousand interviews, like basically no one likes hearing their voice. I mean, some people don't mind hearing themselves talk, but the actual voice, there's like a surprise for most people. They're like, oh, I can't believe I sound like that. My voice is high pitch. They know, <laughs> they, they hyper analyze every single word. I won't say who, but there was one person I had on Creator Lab that after it already been out for, I think, three or four weeks, it was a great interview. Um, and that person watched it, like told me they loved it, like shared it with their social network and then watched it with their parents. And then uh, they text me after saying, hey, I know this is a bit of an ask, but can apparently I say, you know, a lot, which is like everyone has filler <laughs> words. And, and this was before Descript, before you could just take this out automatically. It was like, would you mind like editing it to take all those, you know, that and I was like, basically I was like, no, I can't. Like it's already been out. 99% of listens have already happened. And then he kind of was like uh, nice about it, but was like, look, uh, if you don't mind, I, I'm kind of insisting almost. And uh, I'm happy to pay for the editing time or whatever. But anyway, wow. the, long story so short, it was just, I'm going to use the, the archive stuff. machine. I'm going to figure, Yo, figure out. Gonna, gonna, it's crazy. Yeah. Did, you, did you do but it? I'll, did you do it? Well, my editor, well, yeah, in the end, we kind of, because I have a pretty good relationship <laughs> with him and he's still kind of a friend by this point. And I, I wanted him to want to keep sharing it as well. And I asked my editor at the time and he was like, yeah, look, we, I can go through it. I'm listening to out. every single Creative Lab podcast and the one that doesn't have you know in it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you know, you can tell anyway, you can tell. When you listen to this stuff, you can tell when the natural it's, cadence oh, yeah, yeah, of the voice is yeah, being yeah. I will say right? someone's really smart. You could probably use AI for this. There is yeah. a gap between the audio version and the YouTube version because you can't 
do Loose. this on YouTube video. Like, because the video you'll notice the edit versus on audio, it's actually fine. But anyway, it's completely fair I'm enough. Gonna, but uh, it's well, I'm going to message one. you. I'm going to message you afterwards to turn mine into you know the T Pain auto tune throughout the entire episode. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So a funny story on on the vocal side uh, that I've never told anybody. I don't think he's ever told anybody this. So you guys will know Chris from Modern Wisdom, who's like absolutely exploded Smashed in the it, podcast yeah. space, been sticking out for ages. Love I Island's found- finest. Love Island's finest, yeah. One, yeah. I, I, found, I found Chris really early on. We became good friends. And when COVID happened, we was escaping the UK together because it was dark and miserable. And the second lockdown, I was like, screw this. So we got on a plane together with our masks on, which sitting there on the plane speaking. And he goes, you know what, George? He goes, I realized I want to take podcasting really serious. And my voice is going to be so important that I'm thinking of getting a speaking coach. And I kind of took my mask down. I was like, mate, I go, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I go like Elon Musk, he says a load of errs, Peter Thiel like mumbles. You don't want to become like a TV presenter that's like so robotic. And anyway, he didn't listen to me. And three years later, I'm listening to the Joe Rogan experience and Joe's chatting about Joe Biden uh, with Cameron Haynes. And they're going, oh, Chris Williamson is so charismatic. If he ran for president, I would vote for him. That's how well that guy speaks. And I remember that's just taking crazy. my AirPods out and I texted him going, yeah, you were right about that one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. Wait, do, wait, do you know yeah. the takeaways? Like, what? Like, it was just way better cadence. Just understanding how to c- conduct that conversation. Like, did he ever tell you what it was that made the difference? And he he goes back to like, well, raw hours is a big thing, as I'm sure you guys are seeing, right? When you do it again and again and again, and then you listen back and you have the feedback loops between that is big. But even small things of knowing how to use silences, like you'll notice. The one thing I wrote this, but I've never tweeted it, which is you only appreciate a good podcast host when you've heard a bad podcast host, because a bad podcast host, as Bilal could probably attest to, mm, 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 like constantly like putting in, agreeing. Yeah. Whereas Chris now, you, you realize is how he listens to his guests, when he knows to object, how he pronunciates each individual word. Um, Chappelle's amazing at it as well. Like the way Chappelle uses speed with his uh vocality which is why i think it will become a bigger thing over the next 10 years well george one other thing i was just going to add sorry you know you said the ten thousand hour thing that you said is bullshit for that reason the only caveat i'd say there is i think the ten thousand hours only starts when you start recording with a microphone and the setup and with someone else because there's a difference between talking to your friends or, or sending even a voice note versus like when the lights come on equivalent um, and like, even my, like I'll send my friends voice notes on Arsenal stuff, like on WhatsApp. And I can literally, I can talk for like an hour, like just keep talking about all the little things I saw in the game, whatever. As soon as I started testing, like doing like videos on here, I'd put the lights on, put the microphone on. It's a completely different experience because in the back of your head, you've got, it's not my friend listening. It's the whole of TikTok, the whole of Twitter, whatever. And I think a big one of the biggest skills is literally talking to a friend. It's like that's how I try to record when I do it now. But um, yeah, that's that's a really good point, man. Um, yeah, so should we? You, uh, wanna, yeah, go on. I was just gonna say, if you want a life hack on this, it's a bit serial killer vibes. But you now, thanks to AirPods, you can walk around the street recording a voice memo, and everybody thinks you want a phone call. So you can do it that way as well. Ten thousand, oh, ten thousand iterations over ten thousand hours for sure. Is that as bad as taking notes at the nightclub? Like, is that comparable? <laughs> yeah. What is? I do both. Serial- I do both. I do both now. <laughs> what is more serial killer vibe? Uh, no, I'm, I'm playing, man. Uh, I, I did want to touch on one thing. So, um, George, just to confirm, when you said it'll get way bigger, you're talking about podcasting as an industry. No, well, po- of course, podcasting. That's like. So the essay was uh, what will be what sounds weird or crazy today, but will be obvious ten years from now as a question and the the thing of people being again i could be wrong but of people being more paranoid of their voice or working on their voice as a result of podcasts as a result of voice memos as a result of zoom the same way instagram made people more concerned about their appearance podcast voice memos zooms will do that for the voice oh i buy 100 percent buy that i've seen court i've seen courses pop up left right and center uh maybe not the one that chris took but i've definitely seen people be like hey be a better Zoom presenter or better if you go on these audio uh, or doing these podcasts, 100% buy that. Why don't you rattle off some more of those from that list you did? Because I know Bilal wanted to run through that one. Yeah, the uh, the opening one, I don't know if you've got it in front of you, Bilal, but I can chat them through. So, yeah, I've got the yeah. smart toilet was number one. 
Yeah, this is hilarious. smart toilet <laughs> with the image of it's kind of a split image of I I'll made this in my screen journey. as well. Yeah, the, the good news is that you're hydrated, but the bad news is you have chlamydia. Um, <laughs> and essentially, the idea with the smart toilet that I have, um, and Trung, you might appreciate this. Um, I'll explain why, which is uh, the thing about obviously you've seen biofeedback pop up. I've got a whoop here, aura's huge, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody's really looking at uh, urine or uh, fecal data, right? There's so much value in there that can be used. And I always use the example of um, uh, MindGeek, right? MindGeek owned the whole porn industry. Like they had the monopoly on porn, period. Bigger monopoly than anything we've spoken about. But no government institution ever got involved, I think, because they didn't want to sit in parliament and chat about porn. And I think there's also something to be said about the smart toilet for this very reason, right? In the sense that nobody's talking about the amount of data that exists in these things just because people don't want to have these kind of icky conversations. And I would not be surprised if 10 to 20 years from now, there's a smart toilet that exists that links directly to your iPhone and the amount of data that's in there. And my theory is if the smart toilet does get produced, you could eradicate chlamydia, gonorrhea, all these STIs overnight. Because you would know, inst yeah, you would know uh, at the point of when it happens. Actually, I've actually looked into this randomly, and uh, I don't know if you've read some of these research papers, George. But randomly, okay. yeah, <laughs> you guys are gonna laugh. Okay. Change that story. Let me, let me throw something out to you guys. Exactly what George is talking about. A smart toilet. Let's say you have a house. There's five people in that house. Who do you know is dropping that urine in that pee at that time? Do you want to know what it's called? We have fingerprints for our fingers. What is the equivalent of a fingerprint for the toilet? George, say it. I have no clue. The fingerprint it's called an toilet, anal print. It's called an Jesus anal print. Jesus Christ. So they would literally, every, listen, I'm going to say it's it. Right this is exactly itself, what we're talking man. about. Everyone's is different. Nobody wants to hear this, but this is the reason why, part, like you said, George, Parliament doesn't want to talk about this. I, I agree with you uh, that this is all part of the whoop body movement, but I'm going to throw something out there. I'd love you guys' thoughts on it. George, you're all traveled. Sir, you said a whoop. I just love the way you pronounce it. It's incredible. I know we're all pretty movement. well traveled here, right? We've been to Asia. I don't know if we've all been to Japan. But there's something in Japan which everybody knows is the greatest thing ever. The Toto toilet top, right? The bidet. The smart. It's heated. The smart it gives you toilet. various watering mechanisms for your behind. Incredible. How come this never took off in North America? There's actually a huge case study. That I don't actually know the answer, but this would be my only, this would be my, uh, my devil's advocate to the smart toilet taking off. Cause that toilet seat from mm. Japan is the greatest invention ever. The heated toilet and it never took off. So that's, that's my thought. It makes no sense. But Rory Sutherland has that great bit where he's saying, how does that never take off in the UK or the US? Because if you got shit on your arm, you wouldn't wipe it off with dry paper right but it's the yeah. fact that then we apply that is so bizarre and it is interesting these ideas that exist elsewhere in asia but for whatever reason either the audience isn't there or i just think it hasn't been marketed in the correct way it's probably yeah. path dependence too right it's like imagine first of all the toy seat is more actually you know what let's guys let's walk through this hold on we need path to walk through this <laughs> imagine that you're a hotel right actually because hotels do have them but public toilets you're like why would I put this on a public toilet, right? Is so it why am I going to pay whatever an extra fifty percent on top of that toilet seat? It's going to get destroyed. And you don't like I don't. They, are they yeah. in public toilets in Asia? That mechanism. Yes, I've been yeah. to some in Japan. Like oh. even I was telling. I think I said it on the pod in Mexico City. I would go to this Japanese cafe primarily just to use the toilet because and there's a just huge one, line, right? Because everybody in Mexico. Yeah, everyone knows. Line. Sometimes you don't a, even need to go. You just go. Uh, have a nice little moment of zen you know what i mean that, but <laughs> maybe there's a psychological barrier of the two-way traffic in these countries that don't uh, uh, uh use that. you mean water coming like the how it, like the bidet coming out, out of the toilet into yeah. you <laughs> yeah that's, this that's is fair. the beauty of travel though <laughs> I, I know i know it's i know you guys have had this obviously i know you guys have emigrated to the states uh jack and Bilal. i've learned more about being english in the two years i've been out of the uk than i have in the 27 years i was there and it's only by travel do you begin to realize both how amazing parts of your culture are but how bizarre they are and yeah, yeah. That, that's a uh, that's a good mention that's okay let's point. do the let's keep not let's knock off cool. three more oh. of these things and then can you finish your thought on us versus uk because you never did that from earlier yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, let's yeah, go. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, so two more on these. I'll pick two, uh, two of my uh, favorites here. So one, I think AI uh, matchmaking dating apps will probably become pretty damn big. I think you've seen, I don't know if you guys have seen the graph. It's in there of in 1995, 2% of people met online. It was for this outside bizarre, if you scroll down below, for this outside bizarre weird case here. And now it's 39%. It's Everything else... Everything else is in a bear market. Like for dating, everything is in a bear market. There's one exception here, which I'll point to why I think this is. So you'll see bars and restaurants have gone from 19% to 27%. It's the only thing that's gone up. At work's gone down, school, college has gone down, through family's gone down. I think that can be explained by bullshit. So I think there's a lot of people who've historically met on dating apps. And I know couples oh, like this yeah, definitely. made up a lie about the meeting at mm. a bar. So bar and restaurant, I actually think the number it's is like bigger. The yeah. And it's, it's now, so I think now you, so I like, if you looked at um, a while ago, there's a lot of developers creating Tinder bots and you could do it based off facial recognition. The one thing that didn't exist was like large language models. And I think both my weird uh, male friends and my like normal female friends across the whole spectrum, the one thing they say is they hate the swiping. The single friends, they hate swiping. They hate spending so many hours on these apps that I think you're going to ultimately have personality tests that onboard you, higher end uh, subscription fees that come on and a lot more dates that are dedicated to you. Because what are the odds that you're actually, like it's such a low leverage idea of swiping through people to meet somebody who's going to be your personality. So you factor in um, personality tests, um, like the data you've already got on your swiping around people that you like. I'd be very, very surprised if people are sat there swiping 20 years from now and they're not just paying a higher subscription fee to get match made. Like, like the Black Mirror episode that you kind of saw a couple of years ago. That's you know amazing. what's it's actually happening in these bars and restaurants? Like they're totally just taking notes at the bar and pretending they're meeting people. <laughs> <laughs> George, why don't you mean you better? Oh, I was at the bar. Just, yeah. man, just, uh, Gabe, oh, you don't understand days. when I'm at the bar, I'm I'm on a mission. I'm oh. not taking notes about Steve Jobs and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger while I'm at the bar. <laughs> oh my god, I wrote my first book in Tiger Tiger. Uh, we'll we go. go to the uh, <laughs> go to the next one, but like, I keep scrolling down. Uh, there we go. Uh, we've got the, the first yeah, teenage billionaire. Uh, yeah, I think this is this one will happen. Um, I'm quite confident. So in 2020, Ryan Kaji made $26 million. So he was nine years old at the time. I don't know if you've seen uh, this guy. He's the he one who does toy, toy reviews or something, yeah? Yeah, he does toy Ryan's reviews. Role. Obviously, it's Incredible. a little bit um, it's a little bit like Macaulay Culkin making a load of money when he's young. Obviously, the parents are probably doing God knows what with it, even though I'm sure they put laws in it now. However, I think Yusuf Vitalik quite early on almost become a billionaire. Jack may be able to speak better to this than me. He was like 22, 23 when he did it. I think when you factor in the fact that technology drives the economy and young people are the most tech savvy, Stripe now allows, I think, 13 year olds to start a global business. Um, and in 1971, 78,000 kids were homeschooled. And in 2021, 5 million kids were homeschooled. So if you just like kind of extrapolate the directional of arrows of progress out, you're going to see, like, if you want to talk about a unpopular opinion, but let me frame it correctly. Like, try, if you say child labor now, it's like, Jesus Christ. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you're thinking yeah. Ricky Gervais host, uh, roasting Tim Cook, uh, uh, thingy. but rightly so, right? Because it was horrific for hundreds of years. But is a kid creating a website or creating some kind of cryptocurrency or whatever? I mean, in my opinion, it's better than a lot of stuff that you get taught at school. And will you have an outlier, right? If Elon didn't have school and had homeschooling, what the fuck would he have produced by the age of 15? Like zip yeah. two, probably. Yeah. So I think, yeah. I, I think, and then you just factor in the- We'd be uh, on Mars already. We'd already be on Mars. We'd already be on Mars. Mars. Yeah. We'd be on Mars. I, I have to say, I have a comment about Ryan Kaji and actually I want to throw this to Jack too, who has two kids. I think it's so fucked up that parents allow this. I would never in a million years let that happen to my child because for them to handle those, I can barely handle the dopamine cycles of social media and notifications. Mm. And we're going to talk about smartphone and kill phone out, uh, later, I'm sure. But like, dude, to do that to your kid and like, they're, if you, like you said, uh, Macaulay Culkin, look at these child stars. They're all fucked. Every single one of them are fucked. You're not meant to handle that type of fame at that age. You're just not mentally developed to handle that type of dopamine at that age. I would and say at really any fucked. age. Like, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. That's a fair point. Yeah. And like, oh, Great. And the family is very involved. So I, I know quite a bit about Ryan Kaji and Ryan's world because like secretly I'm like, oh man, what if I do that to my kid? But like I look into that, I'm like, this is so bad. You're taking like, notes on you it. That studio <laughs> set up on the left of the screen right it's now. He's an animal. He does all these Legos. I'm like, man, my wife's like, don't even you think about it. Do you this. not yeah. think about oh it? Oh my god. No, but I'll tell you what, like, I'll tell you what uh 
So you there's can get one a little part. AI filter on him. Trump. I was thinking Trump. like doing it from behind, but like I, all of it's kind of so, icky, man. It's like don't put like Derek Cyber's with this about his child. Like the reason he doesn't put his kids' uh, uh, image online is like I never want to. Those it's like consent. You have to decide for that to Up happen. Up to them, right? yeah, for sure. You, yes. Like for, for like people that put their child. Like, I'm man. I'm pretty so, sorry. I, I I think it's really like my son's in my profile picture, but like, you can barely see him, right? But like to like, constantly be uh, posting photos of your children is so messed up dude i have a rule of thumb which is 99 percent of your audience don't care and the one percent who do you should be extremely oh, extremely dude. worried about tim ferris wrote about this about fame right he's oh. like 0.1 percent of your audience are in, they're literally insane like yeah. the global statistically speaking yeah statistically so if you probably have 500,000 followers yeah. There the Twitter are is probably close to yeah, 10%. Yeah, like 10%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? you have a huge Twitter uh, audience 10% of the audience is something's wrong with them. And you're like, ex you're doxing your family, dude. So Jack, let me ask you about that. So, Sorry, wait, George, go so, ahead. So I, I was just going to, well, I was going to ask you guys probably what you're going to ask Jack's them, which is, and one of the points on there is virtual influencers, which may actually solve this problem, which we can come, we can pin in that and come back to it in a second. However, both, uh, Trung, congratulations, obviously, I know you're a dad, Jack as well. How are you? You're my canaries down the mine, right? Well, you don't have kids, so we're like seeing you guys, seeing what A/B tests you're optimizing for. How are you thinking about when you're going to introduce technology as people who are obviously on the other side of technology, using it every single day? Because you also, I met one girl who has a large following, and her argument for letting her kid build up a following was that the future is going to be that way, and then she's going to be handicapped if she's not. So how are you thinking? Was are you her name Kim Kardashian birthday? by any chance? Or what, what <laughs> no, 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 it's not. But uh, how? yeah, how are you guys thinking about it? Or have you not even thought about it yet? Oh, yeah, I have. Jack, well, Trung's Jack, the, I've been talking too much. I want, I want you to hear from you, and then I'll answer. Well, Trung's down there a few years ahead of me too, but um, Matt, I remember before we had kids, have you ever seen this video of the kid, like, trying to swipe the book like an iPad mm. like, did like had like a really confusing relationship with the atomic world because they're like 90% of the time they're just interfacing with a screen to me that is problematic it's like especially when kids are like developing their physical skills like learning to climb learning to carry stuff learning to put stuff together all that stuff and I don't know. I think by the time you're working on your cognition in school, or like reading, writing, and you're past that point of development, that's when it feels like to me, maybe there is some merit in like showing what is possible on those platforms or on those devices, things like, I don't think there's a, an internet connection is necessarily a part of that process early on. Right. But if you gave a kid a, uh, box of legos i think actually i should have to send this to you guys as a guy i've been following on twitter who's been like writing these guides of like how and when he's introducing certain hardware to his kid and he's like i mm -hmm. give him 16 inch macbook pros because i can see what they're doing in in them um, they can't take them you know under the like hide or whatever else <laughs> under the blanket you're right yeah and and they actually ha like getting this haptic feedback from the keyboard and the mouse and there's like way more going on cognitively there than just like thumping a, a, a screen over and over again. <laughs> um, I haven't thought that deeply about it, but it, there's some instinct involved too. We just see like how much they're developing, doing one thing versus another. And then we haven't quite gotten to that stage where, you know, that's used as like a pacifier either, where understandably people are like, this is the only thing that's going to stop this kid like completely melting down right now. Give them the thing uh everybody i think trung's tweeted about that a few times like the uh yeah i'll answer is like that part exactly like jack what you described is uh before i was a parent i was so man everybody that's not a parent anybody that doesn't total cheap seats like have opinions right like i when before i had a kid i go to not restaurants. in the arena trung yeah not you? in the arena so, right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not in the arena with the kids i used to go to a restaurant like denny's or something and some kid would be on the iPad, I'm like, oh, this is awful parenting. Like four kids, four iPads. I'm like, well, I've seen kids with multiple iPads. And I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. I would never do that. Fucking two weeks into my parenthood, I was like, before having my uh, kid, I was like, I'm going to homeschool. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. One weekend, I'm having slept, just doing everything just to keep this thing alive. Throwing like, iPads at him. Fucking 
dude, here you go, man. Just shut the F up. Like, please give me a say. No, but it's like, honestly, he's like, we're very measured with our iPad, but like we give the kid the iPad. And now when I see, and I go to a restaurant, I see a parent giving a kid a device. I was like, I see you. You're just trying to survive. You're just trying to survive. But uh, we're down and we limit him. It's 30 minutes a day. I won't give him a phone probably until he's 13 or 14. I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, everything Jack said about the physical world, 100% in. We put him in everything. Swimming, biking, karate, soccer. Even if he hates it, we're just we're throwing him into the physical world and uh, we're letting him decide what he likes. Um, but there's some skills that, you know, with a kid, you just ha- he has to be able to swim. He has to be able to bike. And these things are great because they take up time. But the one thing I will say, Jack mentioned with the Lego. So I might do the desktop thing because I like it because it's a haptic feedback. But I'm so bullish on Lego. Like, first of all, he's obsessed. He 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 will literally do Lego for four or five hours at a time. And That's I'm like, incredible, I can't, man. I'm like, yeah. I can't do that. I don't know very many people that can do that for that long. I'm so glad you're obsessed with this particular thing. And uh, but I've been reading more about Lego, and I just uh, Lego as a company. This is literally their mission, right? Like, from they were a toy company before they made the blocks, and when they started making the blocks in the 60s and 70s in Denmark, like their whole thing was like, and to this day, their thing is we want children to explore their imaginations. We want children to learn how to build. And we think this is an integral part about creating a, a, a 360 childhood. And everything they do is to that light. It's like, think about how backwards compatible Lego is, right? A Lego from today can fit with a Lego from 1960. And they're building it because they have this built in, Jack will appreciate the meme mechanism, right? Who has more mind share in toys than Lego? Like no one. Every house open has open source. Open yeah, open source. And just I'm so bullish on Lego. Uh, even though they, they've had a lot of up and downs actually, like uh, as a company. Uh they, they do like five billion in sales. I'm like they're on top of it, but because they figured out uh media in the two thousands, like they had to figure that out. So, like as you see now, they partnered, they've done Lego movies. They've done the Batman Lego movies. They do the Star Wars sets. They do the Marvel sets. They were against all that for decades because they're purists, right, George? Like, they really wanted to be like, we're only for the kids. We don't want these distractions, this superhero stuff. But they had to roll with the punches. And now they're the ultimate toy machine. Like, any new movie comes out, there's a Lego set for it. And they're actually going backwards now. They realize the way the media and commerce work. So before, it was like Lego became that was the ip but they understood the other way now they're like if we want to bring kids into our world we have to go ip first and now like they they got these shows on netflix they make the movies so my son's watching shows about lego and they wanted to go buy those sets now not like watching marvel and they wanting to buy the lego marvel set i'm all for i'm actually for that consumerism i'm 100 for it so that's Mm. my answer i love lego for a kid or a kid raising one of the weird things I don't, I don't know if Bilal and Jack have noticed it was when they've been back in the UK. Growing up in the UK, you would always see kids kicking a football about in the street. And that is almost like they've been exterminated. They no longer exist. You do not see kids out and about. And obviously, I think the pandemic's probably accelerated that. The only thing I can think that's now that's just at that time is video games, video games and social media. Um, there was a stat I was reading the other day that the average kid by the time they turn either 18 or 21 has racked up 10,000 hours of video games. So even, um, again, video games are a, a bit more of a nuanced one than social media because you can clearly see some of the benefits from certain games like Toby from Shopify allowing his whole staff or paying for his whole staff to play Factorio because he's convinced that's what's made him the operator to this day. But then you also see people get absolutely hooked on those things. And now then you factor in that it can also now be a career. It gets more complex. But this, um, a, obviously, with children now eating more and more of their time, but also the kind of real world merging with video games. That's why I'm kind of fascinated by, uh, particularly as one day I become a parent, how do you go about that line of encouragement in certain directions, but also avoiding the Catholic schoolgirl problem? Where if you know what I mean, like you'd say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, then don't think of the pink elephant. And they do yeah, the- think of the pink <laughs> elephant. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just say from my experience is we, uh, I'll, I'll give credit to, a lot of credit to my wife. She's on top of what experience she wants to put in. She, she, she signs him up for all this stuff. She's always restocking his room. I mean, the thing that she does, and when we say my son does five hours of Lego, the reason he's able to do it is because most households with Legos, when it's time to clean up, they just throw them into bin. That's it. And those often get left. My wife has, there's shelves in my kid's playroom 
There's 30 color coded drawers and she puts each Lego and each type every night. It takes like an hour. So she's basically preparing his workspace for the next, I mean, she gets pretty frustrated by it, but she, she's also seeing like his benefit. So to answer your question is, I think a game like Roblox specifically would be very beneficial. And I know a lot of kids, I mean, listen, I know there's some crazy shit happening on that platform too. I mean, you play anything with 13 year olds and like you can have predators on it, like some really bad things have happened. But I mean, to your point, I'd be much more comfortable with him making money quote unquote on Roblox mm. than almost anything else. Um, and yeah, I think I, I'm going to jack on what he said from the beginning. I think real world is, is, is so important, man. I think, if you want to talk about the effects of AI, I mean, we thought when 20 years ago, when people thought artificial intelligence, the wave would come, it'd be robotics that they could do. The, cre the creative stuff, the humor stuff, the writing, the, the professional services, that was our edge, right? Turns out it's the opposite. It, it really is the mechanical stuff that uh, that is much harder for robots to copy, right? Like with your fingers and, uh, and, and I mean- Try and get know, a robot to build one of those cars behind you, Trump. Yeah, dude. You the million, think, I said probably yeah. a hundred million dollar robot. Yeah, right there. that's a hundred million dollar <laughs> robot right there, dude. And it costed me two fifty. And my wife uh, organizing things in the, the shelves. There you go. So, so Jack, what do you, I don't know how you feel about that? Like, like think about AI and where it's headed, right? And like, how much more is tactile important? We man, we live in a in a mad time. I'm sure people are having these discussions when like the radio and TV is coming out, but it does yeah. feel like. When you say my kid's going to have a phone when they're 13, it's like, what is that going to, what on earth is a phone going to be like in mm. however many years that is? Eight years, 10 years. Well, it's not going to be what we're experiencing now, right? Like every, to George's point about no kids around kicking footballs in the street, to reference another NIA guest, Rick Burton, the algorithm that like, you are exposed to is the most captivating thing you can possibly imagine. So in any moment, you're asking a kid to have the discipline to trade. Okay, I'm going to go and kick a ball in the rain outside. And maybe half the people who said they were going to show up aren't going to show up. Or I can just sit here in like ultra comfort with my brain level Instant just getting dopamine. Adults can't even do that. That's riddled the with dopamine. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah, and we in don't the, have the discipline to do that in in most moments. And how do you expect a conscious ten year old? It. And then right. you ask the kid to do that. Yeah. What's hilarious is when you see people on Twitter or X, as it's now known, shitting on video games, not realizing that it's oh, it's playing. basically just a giant fucking video game, yeah. or the ones that are, are on Slack, and it's just like it's pretty much the same. And that's one thing I've always I tinkered with a little bit, but a rabbit hole I'm kind of obsessed with is video game psychology, real life, and they're just kind of merging. Like, and how yeah. long is it? You're seeing the Apple headset coming out next year. You've seen this fucking whoop band here. Like everything is kind of merging together. And I was, I had that realization where the most laziest people I know can play video games 16 hours a day, like focused, dedicated, like and every life decision, like Cartman from fucking South Park is optimized around playing the video game. So the question is, are they lazy or is reality just a really badly designed video game? And that's where I think you, I mean, you're already seeing it, like reality and video games merging more and more. And the, the classic start of the video game industry being worth more than music and entertainment combined and then doubling that. Um, that's wild. George, you said, uh, yeah, let's go into that a little bit more because you mentioned... In, you wrote about this. You said, I'm convinced video game designers know more about human psychology than 99% of psychologists. Is there any like fun anecdotes or anything you've found in your rabbit hole research? Yeah, this, I mean, but what are they doing to uh, hook us? There's quite a few things that, um, there's quite a few things that go on. And I've thought about this, even with my little Apple notes, the way I structure my to-do list is like, uh, you have the to-do list of build a website and then I'll have like, this is how I've actually done projects in the past. She's like level one, define the levels of the task. And then I drop everything down there. And then level two, like is the tiniest next step. And the one thing that you, the main thing you can take away from video games that they do extremely well, that real life does a really bad job at is video games know your exact level and then drop you in that peak flow state. And I remember that in the Val podcast with uh, Farnham Street ages ago. And he said, one of the problems with the education system is you're enjoying maths, you're enjoying maths, you're enjoying English, you're enjoying science, and then 
you're off school ill one day and then they're chatting about a higher level algebra than you remembered. And then that lesson's just gone by and you're gone forever. And you're a level five video game player trying to play level nine. And as a result, you're just bad at maths forever or bad at science forever. And I think the fundamental thing that video games do extremely well is knowing exactly where you're at and giving you enough of a challenge, the classic Mahali can't say his last name flow book, um, the classic balance of being able to push you in the right direction enough but also you can do it. And then it's just those mini feedback rewards. Whereas real life, when people set goals, it's get a six pack. And that's essentially saying complete level 50, but you're just constantly on level 50. Whereas going all the way down to level one of, well, write down ideas of how to get six pack. Okay, on that list is text mate who has six pack, how he got six pack. <laughs> and then, this is how I do it. This I is literally how I, I, I have a whole Apple Note folder, which is just every yo, single Chris, day. Yo, Chris, uh, like I need your ab routine, bro. How many calories <laughs> yeah. you put today, by the way? Because I know, yo, Chris look yoked, man. I've been watching yeah. some of those YouTube videos. He's definitely videos. measuring some broccoli. We've talked about that reference on uh, the podcast. Yeah, he's, but... he's a full stack man. Like, he's a, he's a yeah. terrifying individual. Full stack, man. But that's a good, that's a great example there. It was like the mini wins. You, I think you described it as, and uh, we could, we've all done that in our own lives where you're just like, all right, this is a big goal. Become a millionaire, become a whatever, start a business that does X, whatever. And it's like, yeah, that smaller sizable chunk is more important. You know who else needs it? So you have it at the individual level, right? So like, I'd say at the individual level, imagine how different life will be when you begin to have like quite a lot more metrics around your life. Anybody who's had a Shopify store or a business, when you see the daily metric, and uh, Kiefer Boy has this chat about dashboards where he says, you can judge the quality of a dashboard by how often people check the dashboard. And a dashboard is essentially just a video game XP score, right? Um, like imagine where you could have a human dashboard, which is sleep. So you've got time spent sleep, quality of sleep, uh, nutrition, which is calories consumed, vitamins and minerals consumed. Um, and you go all the way down the stack and each day you see that, I think that's going to become bigger. The one where I think it's the massive fucking elephant in the room, and you're kind of seeing this now, which is like the UK government in particular, I'm sure it's true of the US, like how they go about making decisions. There's no dashboard of how they behave of, uh, uh, Balaji spoke quite a lot about this, a uh, number of homeless on the street. I think it was uh, Mayor Suarez that literally has a, a list of how many homeless people they are. And he knows all the names of every single person. And you're going to see this with data now. But even with inflation, the wildest thing that went completely under the rug during the pandemic was as inflation was going up and you had the COVID restrictions in place, the way they measured inflation before um, the pandemic was they would go into stores and just check prices like mass people from these huge consultancy firms checking prices, which is so archaic in the age of like Amazon and data warehousing and things like that, that they're still doing it. But how absurd this system was shown was that during the pandemic, because they couldn't go in because of social distancing, we was finding out the inflation rate by people sending cold emails and calling up. And you can just see like, even at the individual level now, you're seeing by things where things are becoming a lot more video gamatized, but at the kind of collective societal government level, at the lack of, like I always had this idea of a TV uh, station called BBC Five, where it's just the UK's metrics. And you could just tune in every single day and just see that like, is GDP going in this way? Is employment rate going in this way? And I think you, that'll be a change that you might see over the next 10 to 20 years where websites like Trueflation become bigger and bigger and politicians are held more accountable on the numbers versus it's charisma stupid. The most charismatic person wins. I got a quick comment on this. Uh, a lot of what you just said, let me unpack a couple of those. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, I agree that there's going to be a lot more dashboarding, but I actually have a question specifically around individual stuff. I get stressed out looking at my portfolio, right? When you, you're looking at how many, and first of all, I love how British people say vitamins, vitamins. So you're worried, <laughs> you're looking at your vitamin consumption. Like, is there not a world though where you're like, every day you're tracking your stats? Because I've heard a lot of people that go down the whoop route. They're like, I couldn't fucking do it. It was, just, it was just too much. You need a new toilet trunk. That's how it's going all going to work. <laughs> yeah, optimizing is perfect. And you're not even consuming the numbers, right? That's the like the interface disappears, and the Apple Watch tells you like, okay. hey, you need another stick of broccoli on that plate. There trunk. you go. Okay, I think Jack answered that, but I do want to ask George specifically though. Uh, before the anal print is done by Apple, and we don't have to worry about these numbers, how, do you ever get? Do you feel over optimized? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think the nuance is there. So I felt that exact thing with Whoop and Aura and all this 
stuff that, yeah, if you're checking at a daily level, it's completely point. I think it, it's it's the equivalent of the stock picker checking constantly. But I do think there's there's a lot of value in probably checking something at a, a weekly or a monthly level. I even have that with writing. I just post and ghost things because I think like going in there and like checking, oh, how's this thing done? Is just not good for human it's psychology. Gym, bro. It's yeah, I, f- I fed Trung a little uh, viral viral <laughs> piece last night. We will we'll fire it up after, but uh, yeah, it's it's not. Good. We know we all know, man. Like we've all gone nuclear on Twitter. Like we know what it's it's not good. So I agree with you. But uh, sorry, George continues. Like so, we are you looking at like weekly, quarter? Like well, how are you looking at it? Yeah, I mean, from the like Apple Note stuff is literally just how I structure my day because like it's the classic. Can you just? get the no- smallest next step each day. And I use the little to-do list icons just to structure that. So I can link to that in the show notes if you want. But in terms of other metrics, I think, yeah, I think it just ultimately comes down to what is the most important metric for you right now that you're trying to improve. And then once you've improved it, I agree, checking things obsessively. If you then have a bad night's sleep because you're checking your ordering data, or it's kind of like this reverse placebo where you think you've had a bad night's sleep, and then you wake up and you check your ordering data and it confirms that you've had a bad night's sleep. You've now got this- I double like, in, <laughs> Yeah, you've got this double fuck that now exists, right? So I think, and then and then the next night you're gonna be more stressed thinking about that. So yeah, I agree, there's, there's so much new. I'd literally say like, one of the things I do is I'll have, um, for example, the Whoop stuff, I don't even have the main app on my uh, tail phone. Okay. I have the cocaine one. So I'll just check that once a week, especially if I've just changed locations or try something new. But I agree, if you're checking it every single day, that's a badly designed video game because by by the metric should be serving you, right? It's um, Kiefer Boy has this great bit where he has this how to operate talk. And he says, if the metric of your customer support team is to reduce fraud rate, um, it, it looks great on the surface because what starts happening is your fraud rate goes down, but they start te- treating every single customer as a potential fraudster. And as a result, people are like, oh my God, this is the worst customer service team I've ever like, ever existed. So you then need to balance that with the NPS score. So I've balanced like, is sleep score going up with how often you check it? Because I agree, if you're checking it every fucking hour, then it's it's a, it's the Indians uh, getting uh, off of the snakes by the Brits, right? Yeah, they yeah, gave yeah. them the metric, and you end up with that problem. So yeah, you have to be very, very delicate about metrics. I've yeah. got a glucose monitor in my arm at the moment, boys. It's a f- How's it going, yeah. Jack? Yeah, we were talking about it. Uh, it's good. For the first couple of days, you're like impulsively, like every 20 minutes, checking it, eat something, check it. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah. not registered yet. 10 minutes later, you check it again. It's got nothing to do with how you feel or anything. You're just like trying to... I don't know, a map Play or something. Game, yeah, you've... yeah, and like I'll scan it when I'm feeling terrible and it'll be perfect. And I'll scan it when I'm feeling good and it'll be like less than perfect. So I don't know. I want to say it's been a waste of time, but like, I don't know. It's just been a distraction basically. Like yeah. largely fine, normal results, but then you get like into the nuance of it and I have no idea even how to influence it that drastically. So I'm just spending energy on something I don't need to. Mm. I, I think with most of these things, most of the value, apart from maybe your exception, Jack, comes in like the first two weeks. Like anybody who's counted their macros before, which every like gym bro would have done for one period of time, <laughs> like all the 95% of the value is in the first two weeks. And then you can kind of just finger kind in the air, figure it, it out. Yeah, you know, roughly. Yeah. Bro, has everyone on this call gone to that phase where they ate just canned the tuna? For a couple of weeks, hand the <laughs> yeah. tuna, protein shakes. That's it. Just like what else? Like boiled broccoli, maybe a banana. Like you, you treat yourself with some banana carbs. Uh, wait, uh, George, I, I do want to say one thing. Uh, Ted Mers, who uh, used he's a senior employee or used to be at Bloomberg, had a great article on LinkedIn. He goes, Mer- Mike Bloomberg, who obviously founded Bloomberg in the late eighties, uh, the company's worth probably hundred billion now. He owns eighty percent of it, which is one of the craziest things ever. Mike Bloomberg owns eighty percent of Bloomberg, which is like a hundred billion dollar company, but he has one screen in his office. How many mm-hmm. new terminals did we sell the year to date? That's it. He's like, this is the thing. He's like, I think it's to your point. He's like, find a good measure, and then you can rally mm-hmm. around that. And that one is like, you can fuck around with it, but. Not really. You're like, did we sell this terminal? Because right? they are hard to sell. So the, uh, the 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 fraud stuff, obviously, is a lot more places where you can impact other parts of the business. But I'm actually, so I started reading Walter Isaacson's book on Elon uh, that came out, uh, came out last night, actually, uh, I guess in Vancouver. But a big measure he had when they were going through the Tesla 3 model ramp up, uh, model 3 Tesla ramp up was like, 
can we get 5,000 cars a week? That was it. There's a 5,000 cars a week. That's the one thing. So Ted's big takeaway, and what I wanted to share, and I love you guys' thoughts on is like, if you have one good measure, that is what the company should be gearing towards. And it's kind of gamifying it for the company, right, George? Mm, and avoiding pro like proxies can be dangerous as well. Yeah. Where it's it feels like a measure, but it's a bullshit measure. I remember one of the pieces, I think you put me on Twitter, wrong. it was about Twitter as a video game. You know the paper yeah. that was written? And I listened, there's a really good podcast between the author of that and Ezra, Ezra Klein. And he's chatting about at the beginning about why video games are so good versus reality. And the main thing he says is that it gives you one value to kind of focus on versus reality there's this existential crisis because you've got 30 fucking different values to focus on from your sleep to your parents, to your uh, romance, to your money, to your friend, like everything goes on. And I think the one thing uh, it's weird that be both Musk and Bezos have, have those two things in common where obviously Elon has a micro one of the 5,000 one there, but literally everything is, will this get me nearer to Mars? Yes or no. And it, I mean, it's not an easy life, but it's a simpler life. And uh, whereas Bezos's one was essentially, will this improve the customer quality or the customer experience? Yes or no. And every single decision goes through that. Speaking of uh, quickly, speaking of uh, Musk and Bezos, if you search Trunk Fan and Walter Isaacson's book, he references one of my Twitter threads, people. Wow. There oh, no way. Yeah, there Damn. you go. Let's, let's show this. Immortalized. Right respect. <laughs> Immor immortalized. One line in That's the all you 666 need, one is all you book. need, baby. There we yeah, go. Yeah, so that Incredible. was the picture anyways. Oh, I can't see. Oh. Yeah. Oh, anyways, um did you guys have any more questions on the measure or can we have this US, US UK chat? Let's do it. A lot of Brits here, so keen to hear yeah. what they think on this one. Um Yeah, I mean it's also I'm always keen to hear what the uh, obviously your perspective from being Canadian, right, uh, was where you grew up, right? And yeah. uh, you're kind of like the Diet Coke version of America over there in Canada, <laughs> right? It's like the, the light version. You lived in the US, you lived in Boston, right? Okay, oh, yeah. okay. Um, full stack man, he's experienced it all. <laughs> so uh, I'd say the main realizations I had was within like 30 days of being in the US. I did little periods of times, but I was there, traveled around, did a bit of Miami, a bit of Austin, uh, a bit of LA, obviously not the middle of America, so I probably missed out on parts of that. But one of the big realizations which I don't know if you'll appreciate this one, Trung, over in Canada, but in America, like there's national flags everywhere. It's completely normal. And it's like, of course, there's a national flag outside my bedroom window. In the UK, unless there's a World Cup or a Euros event going on, which then it's completely fine. So it's this weird paradox. That it's completely fine then. But if you fly a national flag during like just a, a standard Tuesday, you're a Nazi. Yeah, you you're, feel you're like BMP is about to turn up. Yeah, oh, yeah. no, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's kind of like a... It's not the same oh, right. norm. And I'd say instead of, it's not just the UK, I'm pretty sure in most countries, I think the US is very flag heavy. You know what I mean? Like you got the milkman equivalent, like riding his uh, US flag and it's normal. And I'm like, oh, this is great. Or you've got like in the background of your podcast, it doesn't like Joe Rogan had it for a long time. And it's like, oh yeah, that's cool. He's American. Of course he's going to have that. Nothing wrong with it. Versus in the UK, if you've got your milkman turning up with a UK, with a Great Britain flag, <laughs> you're like, yo, what's going on? What's going on in my milk? Wait, here? why? You know I mean? Explain this to me. Why? 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 I, I actually... It's an interesting um, question, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a combination of... You know what? A book I really recommend is um, Niall Ferguson. And you, you learn about the British Empire. And I think with time uh, after it's it's also kind of a sign of the uk being on the decline and the us becoming an ascending country there's a lot of guilt right now about being british and when you go through that book you kind of get it like we weren't the best the colonial stuff things. is it the colonial yeah. stuff okay. there's, there's a, yeah like the um, colonial stuff yeah the colonial, is it the stuff? colonial stuff like yeah, in a listeners, I'm doing air quotes. Air quotes, yeah there's yeah. a I, I have read that book. neil Empire. brooks is incredible uh, yeah, it's yeah. an incredible book but yeah I, okay i see what you're saying there's a lot of uh there's a where, well, well, here's a France is the, I mean, French people are very happy to put their flags on, are they not? Yeah, I actually don't, I don't that? know enough about, I don't know enough about, I've not explored France enough to be able to discuss, but that's a keen like difference between the UK and the US. The other one is, um, accents is like a specific one. I noticed that in the UK, if you drive two hours, people's accents change. So, like, if wow. I'm in Manchester and I drive an hour to Liverpool, which is like, a standard Saturday drive that Jack probably does. Like, 
Yeah, he goes like this, like, you know? Trung, it's quite hard to understand, like, it's Steven Gerrard, like, they bring up in their throat a bit, and then you can go, like, two hours down to Birmingham, and in Birmingham, people's accent. So, like, just these short journeys that you can make, even then Newcastle, like, I won't do that one, but you can go, like, one hour, two hours, and the George, dialect. I would say, George, I would say, even within London, you cross yeah. the street. Like, literally, if you go in East London, you've got the... Like I can pretty much tell where someone is from a lot of the time in London, or at least this type of place. Because, for example, in East London, you've got if you go to say like Mile End, Stepney, Bethnal Green, which is nowadays very hipster and gentrified. But there's like a working class white guy accent, like from a council estate, versus the working class Bengali guy versus the working class black guy. And uh, you, I can tell the difference straight away because they just sound very different, and they literally live in the same place. And it's it's kind of a weird thing. I don't, and then you got like Dizzy Rascal, who just sounds like no one else. You know, he's from that same area, and it's it it's really weird. I mean, it's a crazy amount of accents in in one place, in a small amount of place. You know, you know the meta point I had of like explain like you can zoom. There's like 16 things I had on the list, but when I zoomed all the way out, the fucking stack, and you like look down on the UK and the US, like the most meta point you can get is when you read uh, Empire, you go, okay, we're all like. A lot of Americans or a lot of American history is from people who were in Britain or in Ireland or in France or in Germany. And those were just the guys that got on the boats. Whereas the Brits were the ones who were like, that is the most absurd idea ever. I'm not going to go to this magical faraway land in the promise of riches. They just take the piss out of their mates. Whereas the, the, the future Americans were like, yeah, that sounds amazing. I've seen no brochures of this. It's going to take three weeks. 70% of people may die by scurvy, but bring it on. And that actual difference, that A-B test that existed, actually still explains a lot of the differences between them this very day. Like even I remember hearing this metaphor really early on, and it stuck with me, which is in Brit- uh, in America, if you drive a nice car and get out, people will be like, oh my God, what do you do for a job? And you see that TikTok trend, right? In the UK, and this is a little bit of embellishment, but it's kind of true. In the UK, if you drive a nice car and you get out, they'll wait for you to cross the road and then they'll put their key down it and scratch it. So there's a fundamental difference that exists in celebrating success. um, And then that plays into everything. Even at the flag level, I think that's kind of true. It's one of the reasons we don't have it. We don't like to celebrate ourselves. Even when I introduce myself to people, I, like I would play myself down massively. And it's still a problem I struggle with because in British culture, if you kind of oversell yourself, people put you down immediately. Whereas I'd meet Americans and they would like, they would sell themselves. Pitch like, themselves like, Jordan away, Belfort. Yeah. yeah. They'd be like the pen here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Guys, what we've talked about is like, it's similar. I mean, it's tall poppy. It's, in Australia, they obviously call it the tall poppy syndrome, right? Like, like Russell Crowe talks about it all the time. I think Hugh Jackman's Australian. They say, uh, is Hugh Jackman Australian? I think he is, but whole point is like tall poppy syndrome, right? If you go too tall, we cut you down. Do you guys think, because this is this is in Australia, this is in the UK, and it's also in Canada, modesty, tall poppy syndrome, does it have to do with probably the royal background? It's like, you know, there's like, the it was such a tier society, right? We are the, so like, it's kind of that, it's like, uh, it's like immunity or like the viral pushback to that. I don't, that's the only thing I can explain why the rest of the Commonwealth is like that. Or not the rest, the US is obviously not part of the Commonwealth, but why these Commonwealth, uh, you know, Western, uh, 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 hundreds of years ago, primarily Caucasian, why they have this feeling. It, it's a similarity because when you're describing that, I'm like, man, that's like Canada, dude. That's like Canada. You're not supposed well, to. The, so I think it's, you, it's more US versus everyone else versus UK than US. Yeah, I think the US true, is just true. more of a, and my take on it is like similar to what you said, George, earlier. Like I didn't feel very English until I left the UK. Uh, we've probably mm. talked about that on the show before. Now I feel very English. I love Nando's kebabs and Arsenal. Like there's <laughs> nothing more English than that to me, right? So, but when I lived there, I felt very much like a Londoner, but not necessarily like English. And that's also because I'm Pakistani. There's like a layer there. Um, but I do think that idea uh, like of the tall poppy syndrome is true. And I don't know if it's just a, that's not in our taste sort of thing. And a lot of that maybe does come from having a royal family and even subconsciously having this thing of that's a proper way of doing things, even if we reject a lot of that stuff. Versus US, it was just everything, all rules out the window, rebuilding from scratch in a, it's a, quite a short period of time compared to you know France, UK and other places. Um, but I'm still, I'm sensing within a certain segment of the US population, that kind of guilt that you described as well, generally more left-leaning, 
right? Like less uh, flag, you know, like for example, on the 4th of July, I saw my feed on Instagram, there were two types of people. There was the people posting the flag and being like proud to be American style. And then there's the other people like shitting on America who are American saying, I'm like saddened by the history of this country and the way it is in today's society, etc. So I, I think we are seeing that here a little bit, but the UK has its own kind of unique history with the empire. So uh, that's kind of my take on it. The whole colonial <laughs> thing in air quotes. The whole colonial thing. Exactly. The whole colonial thing, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few things in there as well. I think one, the UK economy has stagnated for 10 years. I don't know if you guys have seen that graph, like it's completely stagnant. Um, I think another thing about the UK is it's a lot more of a zero sum or a negative sum game, just purely on a geographical basis alone. The UK is kind of two countries. Obviously, you could say it's Scotland, Wales, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and England, but it's actually really London and everybody and else. else. Yeah, so, like, you ha like I always use this example of in America, if you want to get into politics, Washington. If you want to get into tech, San Fran. If you want to get into finance, New York. If you want to get into entertainment, LA. In Britain, London, 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 London. So there's that that then begins to exist as well. But that being said, we there's a lot of criticisms you can give to the the UK, and I think that's the irony is I wrote that at the end of the piece, which is we it's kind of a meta point here that me, Bilal and Jack will probably criticize the UK more than we will criticize the US because that is by definition a very British thing to do. And I actually love that part of British culture. Looping back around to Gervais at the start, the, the, the thing you can say about the UK is some of the best comedians come out of there. And there was a, a sort of thing I noticed with Americans as well, where in America, the culture is you can taught, you can, you can be taught that you can be anything. Um, but as a result, the self-esteem is slightly fragile. Whereas in the UK, kids are brutal. And I think the more northern you go, blah, the more brutal it gets. And yeah. as a result, it's kind of bad, but the they're a lot more anti-fragile. They've had like the vaccines very early. You know what I mean? Like they've had a lot of stuff very early on. So there's the UK, um, for all its criticisms, also, like I said at the start, there's there's very few places like it. Yeah, that self-deprecating humor comes from that same thing. Yes. Right? Like that's a hundred percent. It makes that's tough really people for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Except for us southern fairies in London, as you exactly. say, you know, lock, stock, two Wait, smoking hold barrels. Hold on, we need to ask this though. <laughs> I don't know, George, if you remember a couple episodes ago, we were doing what's your favorite European city? And Bilal said London. I'm Had like, to keep bro, it real. Yeah. You can't answer your own city, man. I haven't so lived there for you, a long time, Trunk. You know? George, you're well traveled. What are your thoughts? Favorite European uh, city? Oh, it's a good question. I was just going to say, when you go past Bilal's, he's the only guy in America with a British flag outside his house. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, um, in terms of my favorite European city, Amsterdam. Amsterdam by far. Okay. Amst Amsterdam is a, a paradox of a clean sin city. You get clean metropolises like uh, Dubai or, um, and then you get the alternative, which is Vegas, where it's like crazy in chaos. Amsterdam has it all. And then everybody's beautiful. Uh, everybody's super respectful. Um, I think Amsterdam, if you've never been, is, is the best, best city in Europe. You're referring but specifically you still, to the red light district. And you still got that. <laughs> George, you got that warehouse project still in you there, <laughs> mate, from the Manchester yeah. days, you know what I mean? George, yeah. I know, yeah. George is rolling nice. in the red light district taking notes Tiny about notes. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, oh man, this place is amazing. Well, let me take some notes about Benjamin Franklin. Let me take some notes. <laughs> oh, George, you... You talked about that. I mean, one of the best raids you've put out, I think might be your most viral one, was what is ignored by, uh, ignored or neglected by the media, but we studied by historians. Did you want to go into a few of these? I think you just yeah. talked about the UK. I mean, there, there was one in here about UK market inflation. That was interesting, but there's a bunch in here. I don't know if there's any you want to touch on. Yeah, one of the wild ones that I always say to Americans is, is quite recent, this one, which is the UK put out a job uh, for the head of cybersecurity recently. I don't know if you guys saw this. Yeah. Um, at £57,000 per year. And the the salary gap that exists between the US and the UK is so significant. I always use the example of Singapore where um, they pay politicians 750 k per year and they have bonuses. So going back to specific metrics that we spoke about earlier at the kind of collective level or the government level, if they hit certain targets. I don't know if you guys have seen this viral clip that's going around at the minute where they asked Warren Buffett what he would do about the deficit. Have you have you seen this? No. And he says, it's, it's amazing. He goes, I can solve the, the US's deficit in five seconds. And the reporter goes, go on. He goes, well, anybody who's in charge um, during the 
deficit, if it goes uh, 3% um, above GDP, so if you spend like 3% more, it goes, you can never get voted into office again. It's like the classic Munger or Buffett, right? And show me the incentive, show me the outcome. But go, circling back to the UK, it's it's crazy that this kind of gap exists. Um, but the whole point of this piece was the, yeah, what is ignored by the media, but will be studied by historians. I think you kind of see this frustration in X, which is why this piece hit so hard. I think Elon and Paul Graham and a few other people like commented on it. The, there's this gap right now between the kind of legacy media and what they're talking about. And you've probably seen it as well, where you pick up on these topics just from being on Twitter or from being on X or following weird niche accounts. And then they're mainstream news 12 months from now. And it's really interesting yeah. seeing this kind like of a lag, cycle. Yeah. And then the historian, and it's that classic question of, well, what, like, for example, a great question would be, or a great answer to this question would be, and this is how I came up with the, the question behind this piece was in uh, the New York times, I forgot what year it was when Adolf Hitler left jail. I don't know if you've seen the article. It's like Adolf Hitler has left jail. He's uh, decided to have a quiet life and become like a reader or oh, writer. After the beer hall putsch? So probably 22. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, that's an example of well, what is ignored by the media, but will be studied by historians, right? That is a big one. And I love asking that question because you kind of get so many different answers of what people think are the most important things to be talking about right now. Well, yeah, wait, so uh, rattle, rattle some off. Rattle, r- rattle a couple of them. Yeah, one of one weird one is uh, Japan's homeless rate. Why does Japan have so few homeless people? If you look at the, there's a graph that I shared in there, um, like, are they lying with their stats? Are they doing something unethical? Or are they doing something we don't know about? Either way, it's an important question that very few people are exploring. Um, one of the actual answers that I explored in the piece was uh, the fact there's these gaming cafes that so many of the potential homeless people live in, oh, yeah. uh, which is not a good outcome, but is it a better outcome? Another one of the, uh, one, one in there, number 19 is, the uh, how incredible modern aviation is. And I always have this anxiety attack whenever whenever I get on a plane, I'm like, I'm going to be the guy that fucking dies today. I always get it. As soon as we're taking off, I get it. But um, it's a crazy start, which is in 2021, there was 2.2 billion airline passengers, but only 176 deaths. And then you contrast that with 1.3 million people that died on the road. And it's this, like we say, the it's, most it dangerous is a truly trip. Remark. People say you're more likely to die on the way to the airport, like in that cab, right? Than in the airplane. Like, oh, like a thousand. You feel 10, that for sure, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. If you're in New York, Balao, you're feeling Dude, that 10,000 times on the way. Yeah. These drivers yeah, yeah. do not care, man. Um, I had a, uh, well, actually, Jack. Well, I know Jack has thoughts on this. The, because uh, you're always way ahead of the curve, Jack. Like uh, you mentioned quite a bit when you see something on Twitter, the news is like six months later, but like, you're like on the discords, man. Like you're, you're way ahead <laughs> of everyone. Well, I, I had to get out of that manual. I mean, I think George was there for this stuff too. Remember the early COVID stuff with fuck, people face down in the street. And I'm like in Brooklyn at the time, I'm like Celia, it's over. It's yeah. over. Like Mask we're, we're getting, uh, yeah. And so there's benefits and there's yes. obviously massive drawbacks to being on the, the front end of that stuff too. Um, yeah, my, like my information diet has gone like I've gone. I just go extreme, one extreme to the other, basically, like paying infinite attention to this one thing to then like I have to turn that off because it's just driving me nuts. Go like cleanse the feed entirely and then it will completely change the trajectory of what I'm working on, what I'm thinking about, all of that stuff. So what's it been for you last six? I mean, obviously, checks has taken off last six months or so. Like how, how much has your information diet changed uh, because of that? I think that's like changing the information diet in December of last year was how all of that came to be. Okay. So I was like, I got off the zero hedge and associated account train back. <laughs> this was before the for you algorithm. My shit is back to that now. You know, it's like, I'm logging on. It's Armageddon every, it knows you better than every you know other yourself. tweet is like, yeah. it's pressing on my fear centers. Like I wouldn't even know how to do if I designed it myself, you know? One one thing I uh, recommend, I did this once by accident. It was quite a fucking powerful exercise, which is go on YouTube and look at your activity log for the last two weeks and just kind of audit it in the cold light of day. And now you're not down any rabbit holes of like <laughs> content that I now like enjoy or liked. And the amount of it was like, for me, it was like 10%. And either it was comedy content or it was long form content. When I kind of got in these short form dopamine hits that was a problem i then started doing it with instagram as well i i've always had a problem with instagram i always delete it off my phone i just found it to be either inducing of softcore porn 
or extreme envy. Like it's one of the two. And I went through Instagram and I was just like, I had this new rule of thumb, which is, does this educate me? If, if no, I'd go to the next question. Does, did this make me laugh? If no, go to the next question. Do I want to see this person in the next six months? If no, mute. Mm. And it's like a super simple logic tree and training the algorithm. However, the for you-ness of every single algorithm now, even Twitter, almost makes this difficult to, to fight. I do wonder whether, obviously, the incentives from an ad ecosystem is that these platforms control the algorithm because the more hooked you are, the more ads they can serve, and you've got this endless loop that exists there. Or there's the kind of maybe more Steve Jobs approach of, will you ultimately give users the control over their algorithm? And will they be able to, Jack can wake up and go, I want the kale algorithm today. Or you know what, it's Saturday night, let's party. I want the cocaine algorithm today. I want zero hedge. And I want the school fight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cafeteria fight. <laughs> the cafeteria fight. Oh, road God. rage. Yeah. I'll get that tried. Of just crazy <laughs> stuff on that. Always man. works. No, That's why. I think yeah. they turned it down because the, I remember Jack called it out specifically like maybe two, three months ago. Oh, it was absolutely mental. It was mental. It was like people getting executed on there. You know, like wake up <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning, you're like open the phone. It's like, and why am I looking at this? <laughs> Wait, okay. Actually, um, so George, you just mentioned it there. This was something you'd sent me before and you kind of touched on Apple's choice. It's kind of related. So I'm just going to bring it up. This was the uh, thing you shared with me around the yeah. difference yeah. between how Facebook and Apple package their app tracking. Do you want to just explain for people who are only listening and they can't see what's on the screen, the difference between yeah. the two, why it's worth talking about? Yeah, I'll unpack this. So when apple wants you to opt in for ads there's a personalized ads button that pops up and it says do you want to turn on personalized ads or do you want to turn off personalized ads and then when every single other competitor from meta to twitter to etc cetera, etc cetera, wants you to opt in for uh, at, like tracking it says ask app not to track or allow to track and you can see there the russell conjugation that exists so you know the uh, eric weinsteinism of he sweats you perspire she glows and they've simply by controlling the language they control the narrative yeah. and it is Incredible, one of the yeah. craziest things i've seen in history of them single swiping facebook what, what one of the things in there as well is so uh google pays apple 20 billion now a year to be the default search engine. So Apple has Google by the bollocks. Like they could just rub pull Google at any minute now and just say like some new AI search engine we're going to implement. And realistically, if they put that in there, would I be like searching Google now? Maybe back in the day I would, but Google's product for me as a user has gone so badly down the drain that they've got that ability. They've obviously- You're not going to miss all the ads? You're not going to miss all the yeah, 17 ads you get on the search <laughs> page? No, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Google, no, Former the Google <laughs> inside agent, sarcastic yes. way, it's like a, oh, man. incredible. Inside <laughs> agent. No, no, no. Um, Chat GPT the, boys. You know, it's there not even go. the ads, but like, forget the ads of like how much there is with Google now. It's like some I forgot which tweet who wrote the tweet, but it was something like when you Google what disease you have, you haven't found what disease you have. You've just found what disease has the best SEO. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's true, true now. Most right, profitable well. keywords on that disease. <laughs> oh man, it's so crazy. Anal those those sites are crazy. Boys. <laughs> Anal print's gonna change everything. <laughs> <Anal> <laughs> I'm gonna Wait, get, hold on. Yeah, if they listen into this conversation, I'm going to yeah. get the weirdest fucking answer. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah. I got a quick comment on that. Dude, you have, so so Apple has an internal search project. Everybody knows this, right? Like the way they built maps. So Apple Maps is better than Google Maps, in my opinion. It's way more uh, people friendly. Like uh, it'll tell you turn right instead of like, you know, the arrows. So uh, but think about that. The opportunity cost for Apple to launch their search engine which doesn't have to be that great, right? Nope. But it's $20 billion a year, which is going directly to the operating profit, right? That's like a 100% margin uh, money. Uh, somebody said, uh, there's a viral tweet that basically to the effect of they spent 50 to 100 billion on like AirPods research and uh, the uh, the uh, the VR research. It's like all straight from Google. It's like, thanks. Thanks, dude. Thanks for all this money over the past decade. But uh, yeah, that's wild, dude. Defaults, very what? powerful. That's a great one of the call bits, out though, the, the difference in language though, man. That is 
That is funny. The subtle framing, right? It's 1984 shit. And nobody nobody has really spoken about it. By the way, Bilal, you probably appreciate this. There's actually some subtleties in how they do track you with IDFAs and a lot of nerdy talk that we could go on to. But ultimately, at the end of the day, should they be the both the platform that's deciding the language and the advertiser whose ad revenue is now at 5 billion and is set to grow like crazy? I mean, you're seeing them all come in, right? Amazon, who now make more money off ads than they do from Prime, which is an insane statistic. Like I, I went down the rabbit hole of, Amazon being the number one advertiser ever. Because you had the quote 15, 20 years ago from Jeff Bezos saying, anybody who uh, anybody who does advertisement is essentially wasting time. They should be thinking about making their product superior. And now like in 2023, it's like, we spent the most on ads ever, but asterisk, we made more money from Amazon ads than we spent breaking the world record on ad spend. So you're seeing this come up, but specifically on Apple, they're they're looking at it now going, this is just free money. So they expect uh, Apple's ad business to rise to 40 billion within the next five years, whilst they're basically destroying all their competitors and there's no government oversight, no monopoly legislation coming in. I think that'll be something that will be studied by historians that yeah, is absolutely. being discussed you, about, but, are, are they gonna copy the model, the Google model of? No, the app, the app, app store? store keyword. Actually, yeah. you know who has a good article? Uh, we can post it. Uh, uh, Turner Novak, a uh, friend of the show, he did a whole article about uh, uh, Apple's advertising opportunity. Um, app Store obviously is a big one. Uh, the keyword searches on App Store. He's like the notification screen, massive. But man, dude, if Apple starts feeding me ads on the notification, yeah, screen, that's kick rocks, bro. No, that's not I, good. Yo, I am not cool with that. But, I don't uh, think they'll do Safari, that. If they did, Safari, that would be surprising. Yeah, this is crazy, it. right? Yeah. Maybe they'll give you a free phone or a free plan yeah. if you have the ad experience on, right? That's probably, uh, what is it, like oh, ride free yeah. in an Uber if you have a TV like and in front of your face. Everybody takes that, right? Everyone yeah. takes that. Um, I, I mean, think it's my, mostly at the moment, I think it's App Store though, right? Just to confirm. Yeah, Ma- App Store. I'm assuming it's App Store. That's where, Mainly and Apple. that's the equivalent of Amazon, the way Amazon is obviously primarily on you know the product style ads that you see on amazon but yeah, I, I, think the search, is a, yeah. I mean the app, yeah. the app store thing is a compromise like a big compromise for them too you know because majority of search results you get on the app store are not the best you know like like if you're and the real estate is not it's not like google where you're used to going like three or four pages you're just like just to put the thing that pays the most at the top of the keyword thing is actually, this is a guess, but it's downgrading the experience of the phone, right? Like if if the thing that hasn't succeeded on merit is the top of the results each time, but there's there's trade-offs there, obviously. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, it, does, yeah. it does make sense. Like I've got shit ass calculator app that has like a uh, advert coming up between every button I press. Oh, that's, and that's the, the thing stuff, I get yeah. when I search. Calculator is a bad example because it ships with one, but you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Spirit level or something. Yeah, it's annoying. The, like, yeah, that level of ad is ridiculous, yeah. And the, the apps ones are weird. fucking hellish, the ones the that other, have it. The other thing is, the Jack, ads those, those ads on a lot of the apps aren't Apple ads. And I, I know for a while, like this is years ago, they tried, was it iAd or something? They were, and they were trying to up level essentially all the shitty display ads we see on apps. They should do that, yeah. They did that for a while and it didn't really work, unfortunately. The idea made sense, but it didn't work because you're paying a premium for the same inventory and people just weren't willing to pay the premium. The targeting was also shit. So I think the the thing is a lot of this, I think the app store is the big biggest opportunity and it's like they're already making a good chunk of money from there. But to, the the higher level premium ad like that makes a lot of sense, but no one's really been able to crack it. The closest you've got are video ads on the internet, so you get them on mm. YouTube and stuff. But even they're not really premium, are they? Like you get a bunch of shitty pre roll mm-hmm. ads on YouTube and stuff like that. No, dude. So, actually, to your point, like, yeah. like what is a Delta? You'll know this. A a TV ad, I think, is nine times more valuable than a YouTube ad. It just speaks about. It depends what what. How you define that, I guess. Like, well, I guess when a sporting you say valuable, event, sporting event is like totally focused, right? When you it's say like, valuable, you mean how much they're CPMs. being charged? CPM. Like, that's how much they're yeah, charging yeah. or the actual value to the, the advertiser. CPM. You could argue that's just a delay, like, okay, you know, fair enough. But I know it's, it's like, for example, if they charge nine times more, is it really nine times more effective for the advertiser? Like, that's kind of the question. I think I'd the have. argument the person was making, uh, I love you guys' thoughts on this, is like the YouTube ad is obviously your, your attention is much more fractured, right? Likely. 
Whereas if you're watching I don't know, I mean, the Super Bowl, if you're Bowl, watching TV, yes, Super Bowl, but ninety percent of people are second screening, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, most yeah, people true. skip ads, so you could kind of argue both ways. But no, I get, I get what you're saying. I, I think for me, the big opportunity has always been this premium form of ad, which just like people fucking hate ads either way, even if they look a little bit nicer. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I think it, they've got a big opportunity either way. Go on, George. One thing that the, one of the uh, counteractions that people get, obviously, we spend a lot of money on app advertisement one one of the counteractions that you only get when you're deep in the weeds is people then go well yeah well google's got android but android ask any advertiser and blab could probably testify this not as android valuable. users way less value so apple both has the hardware than the advertising platforms to launch apparently one of the reasons they actually did this was they were so annoyed internally that their number one apps facebook instagram and whatsapp they were making no revenue off which part of me is like, guys, chill down, chill out. You've got enough, right? Like, can you, you're a trillion dollar company and you're still wanting more juice out of the, out the squeeze. And they even went to Facebook and pitched them to do a premium version, subscription version. And apparently Zuck and Co didn't buy it, which is one of the reasons why they brought through this iOS. We're here to protect people's data. Whilst then they're helping personalize ads, grow their ad network. It's 4D chess. It really is 4D chess. I'm just looking forward to the day where we've got our Vision Pro headsets on and we're getting retargeted with England flags <laughs> and loads of different things around the living room. Yeah, Manscaped. Look constantly. down right now, Manscaped. And, yeah, and smart toilets. Yeah. Brian, yeah. come in, get smart. your anal print done in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, now. Incredible. Wait, I had a, wait, George, there's something I've been meaning to ask you and I couldn't confirm it. Uh, did Rick Rubin send you the book, The Creative Act? yeah it was Dude. a weird one um oh my goodness congrats man i didn't know if like i couldn't tell from the tweet if you got it from him or you were being like opaque enough to make people think you did which is also kind of genius because i'm like oh damn this motherfucker knows rick rubin so tell us what well, happened i don't know him but he uh uh again that piece i wrote which is like how to be creative about doing drugs which we're going to talk about right after this yeah, reached a lot of people and it goes to show, I mean, it's kind of a visualized value probably, but you just don't know. I, I, you don't know how big the internet is and you don't know who's going to be reading your stuff. And yeah, reached out wanting to send the book and then got it. I've not had any communication with him apart from that. Um, but yeah, really, really cool. Twitter DM. You got a Twitter DM. Correct. And then through somebody from his team reached out and then sent the book over. And it's really cool. Really, really cool. But yeah, it's just like the... You just don't know who's going to be reading it, which is kind of the biggest right. takeaway I got from that. How, how many oh. impressions on that thread, George? Pull it up again. 5.6. 5, 5. 5. Um, but only million. one that mattered. Only, only one, one that, mattered. that mattered, people. That's yeah. it. That's but a meta lesson Let's here. talk about that because yeah. uh, this was actually one of my favorite threads you've written about, mate. This is really, really cool. Do you want to break it down a bit? Because all, all of us here have a layer of creativity. So I think a lot of people listening to would gain from that. Yeah, so there's this meme of, uh, people may have seen it where there's two doors and there's one that has a humongous queue in front of it. And then there's the door next door, which is completely empty. And I kind of noticed at this like TikTok guru level right now of everybody trying to, if you're not working 24 hours a day, you're a loser, what are you doing? But then I actually began to realize as I kind of hung around people who are doing better and better in life, their work ethic actually sometimes goes down a bit. And it's that moment when they're kind of sat down or randomly thinking about things that it begins to come. And there's there's so much content around how to be productive, but there's almost nothing around how to be creative. One, probably to steel man the, the opposing cases, it's a lot more easier to formulize a productivity, a Pareto principle or something like that. Whereas creative, it can be so individualistic. It can apply to the individual. And maybe, you know what, some people just aren't creative, but everybody can be productive, which I think there's some truth to the argument, but I think realistically, more likely what it is, it's just a shadow of the industrial era of the Victorian schoolyard era where everybody's kind of a cog in the wider factory machine and people haven't been taught how to think creatively. So I just kind of went through what I thought was important, which was essentially the main thing of the thesis was at like a first principles level, the brain has inputs and outputs and creativity is an output. If you define it, what is creativity? Creativity is an output that is both novel and useful. And then the mistake that people try and make is they try and just put the same input in more times like they would for productivity versus just getting as many new inputs in there. 
And then there's like a variety of different techniques. So one of them I called the Swedish house mafia technique, which is, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but maybe you could play it um, in the edit, yeah. which is when Swedish house mafia went away and uh, created one. I thought man skulle göra någonting typ sånt här, alltså... So, they're in the studio. Det är för mycket gjort med allt. Ja, det är det. Men det är så lite mörkare. Chatting shit about different beats. Den behöver inte vara speciellt melodisk beroende på vad vi ligger på sen. Nej, det kan vara så här. Om vi har liksom några värsta kort som kommer in sen. They're really Swedish now. Typ som i Lido och Behind så har vi bara ett ljus som går så bara ding. Ding. All right, should I start? You guys, we get the idea, yeah? All right, so what's the takeaway here? We get it. What is, it, what is the yeah, lesson? It, it then moves on at the end of the scene where they have like the full on song made, which anybody who, uh, into dance music it's like one of the most iconic dance tracks that's ever been made and i think the idea of, in terms of maximizing creativity is one of the techniques is literally just locking yourself away with two or three people and just spitballing ideas you've seen that idea but i kind of i should change the name of this one i mean you could call it the swedish house mafia technique or you could call it the manhattan project which is like just literally getting a few people in a room taking all the devices away from them and just jamming which i think as somebody uh who's in a remote setting you appreciate that more and more of being in a room late at night till 3 a.m. It's if you look at it, Nate, like pretty much all albums are made that way. Right? Pretty much. So when you're looking at the apex of creativity, which is probably musicians, all of them kind of have to be in a room. And it's just like idea tennis where Trung fires an idea over to me. And then I get that and I fire that over to Blau and each stage everybody has a bottleneck that they would have at the individual level. But the fact that Trung can unpluck my bottleneck and then as a result, I progress 70%. And then when Trung hits a bottleneck, I unlock his. And the compound growth of three to four high quality people in a room, particularly for creativity, um, I, you just achieve so much more than being at the individual solo level, sitting at a blank page, waiting for ideas to happen. I mean, this is the number one reason against work from home, to be honest. Like I, I completely buy, I, I hate the office, I hate commuting but I completely buy everything you just said about that. I mean, the famous one is Pixar, right? They made four moves from one lunch. These guys, uh, it's like it's Ed Catmull. Uh, who are the major guys there? You got, anyway, four of them had lunch and they made four movies, like Finding Nemo, um, uh, Monsters, and uh, another one all came up for a single lunch. And it's just this idea of like, exactly, it's like just batting ideas around tennis. Uh, what'd you call it? Creativity tennis? Yeah, like like idea tennis. Like Idea, ten I think idea, idea tennis. Idea tennis is like one idea, but then like at the polar opposite end of that is just spending a load of like, I call it, um, I stole this word and I still actually can't pronounce it, which I think it's called Sakoko, which is this idea. I remember one thing that kept coming up was whenever you ask people where they want to travel to, they say Japan. I'm like, why does, why does so many people want to go through to Japan? But when you actually do the history of Japan, they close the borders for like 270 years. Um, and as a result, anybody they who tries to leave- fly. Yeah, yeah, anybody who tried to leave executed, and Bitcoin, anybody who joined. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, anybody sorry, who uh, came back, uh, tried to leave executed, anybody who tried to come in executed. And as a result, the culture is so unique from this time alone. I think if you look at uh, like, like a spectrum right now, we're so interconnected. So therefore, the Swedish house mafia technique is great for like, high quality people, but also I think like a week every quarter, just pausing all life's momentum and having a bit of time. And people do like a silent meditation retreat, but I always think that's kind of the, I don't even heard the Derek Sivism where he's chatting about um, when he sprinted one day to beat his running score and realized he only beat it by about 10 seconds. And I think just going away, like an unshut, like shutting off the plug, um, turning off phones, but still enjoying yourself being with like a girlfriend or a wife versus like sitting there for 16 hours a day trying to meditate your way is the equivalent of the sivers trying to do the sprinting but that idea of once a week uh sorry once a quarter having a week just alone with your own thoughts i remember when i did it i was just getting such novel ideas that i would never be able to tap into without it because realistically i, I realized it only took into about the fourth day where previously every thought i had was just society's mimetic voice 
just going around my head. And it was only on the fifth day that I began to actually find my own voice. And as a result, began to spark a few more creative ideas. So there's two techniques that kind of exist at opposite end of the barbell of one, get around high quality people and lock yourselves in the room till 6 a.m. at night. And then other two, other one is the other end, which is time alone with own thoughts, which again is midwit meme, right? It's like, just go away, be by yourself. And make well, sure you leave the cocaine phone faster. at home yeah, as well. Leave the cocaine phone at you home. You don't want to be there seven days on your own with a cocaine phone. You'd be getting distracted too much. You know what I mean? Jack, so, I need Jack's opinion on this. Because Jack's a big solo operator too because of uh, his current setup, two kids. Jack, what are your thoughts on working with other people? Uh, how much of your current stuff, a lot of it is, is solo, right? So, Well, you know, it's interesting. Work? This year, no, I've been working with... Uh, couple guys oh that, that's right on your uh, uh, to, to do checks together help build all of this stuff and it is a massive like ridiculous unlock if you the weird thing about this year specifically is the two guys in particular i've been working with like you have very similar taste but very different skills i say different but like complementary but not the same school of thought or like the ability to write solidity and build the front end of a website is very different than like composing the image itself and conceptually tying everything together. And those two complementary skill sets can build something that is one, like orders of magnitude more than one plus one, right? Or the two of you working in a silo. And I've resisted working with people for a long time just because I had a got fed up with it over the course of however many years in a corporate environment. And it's when you're doing something that you really love doing and finding people who, when they contribute to that thing, makes it infinitely better. It's like massive unlock cheat code. We actually came up with uh, Jalil and I specifically, we're in Austin together. We like spoke at a conference in february or march or something and we like just around the talk got like six hours both days to sit together and it was like it's like doing a month's worth of work in those 12 hours and it just make you think like man how much could you get done if you were like doing that even one day a week like trying mm. to like all the entropy that exists between you like being 3500 or 4000 miles apart in different time zones but there's definitely some you know if you have a high trust and you tr like have good taste, you build great stuff, but they're really like, there's a lot of uh, probably like metaphysical stuff happening in person too, where you like read other people's, there's like a lot of nonverbal communication happening too, right? Music, developing music is probably one of the most incredible examples. That I was like, you don't even need to listen to what somebody says. You just see how they react. One of my favorite videos is, um, you know, the Kanye Jay-Z where he's playing him the beats from, uh, I think it's a blueprint. It's, yeah, Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen that one where he's like, he, oh, fuck, it's, he just it's feels insane. It. And also in the There's Kanye no conversation when, happening. It's just like, oh, fuck, that's it. Yeah, also, when Pharrell hears, uh, is it through the wire or something? I can't yeah. remember which one. But you see Pharrell's face be like, looking around like, what did I just hear sort of thing? And that is with, the, with music, especially you kind of can't compete with it. But I think Jack, what you just described is exactly what we started the show with. It's the midwit meme kind of again, right? Yeah, like, yeah. music's like, good. And then it's yeah. like, oh yeah, go and fucking. Or like the office good. even like yeah. coming back to that. And the one where I'm seeing now is we're going back to cubicles in some places. Like it's used to be seventies, eighties, you, you oh. work in a cubicle. It's like this. And then you had like two thousands, <laughs> these open floor plans, which look great with fucking bean bags everywhere. And then you just couldn't <laughs> work because everyone's in the air <laughs> chirping. And then now we're going back to like nicer looking cubicles in a lot of offices, like they have privacy. They won't call it cubicles, but it's essentially the same thing. And it's, it's kind of funny just, uh, yeah, how it works, man. We all, we all uh, guilty of that one. Um, boys, we're getting to the time soon. So uh, anything else for George before we let him well, go and enjoy well, the we're evening? we're going to say what's funny, Bilal, is... Uh, well, what time is it, George? In... Uh, in uh, uh, sorry, Northern England right now? Uh, half seven. Seven thirty. All right, cool. Oh, good. Are you, are you, are you going to be headed to the pub to take notes later? Like, what's going on right <laughs> after this? <laughs> no, no, I'm just chilling. I'm just chilling with family, but... Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, no, no, nothing too crazy. Cool, cool. I'll tell you what's crazy about this is the, the entire... Uh, reason for this, we were supposed to do this was the kill and cocaine phone. Yeah. I mean, I've written about it. We talked about it previously that these guys didn't have time to try it out. But 
George, let, let, let's hit you from the source here. Uh, have you stuck with it entirely, the kale versus cocaine phone? And if you want to give the 30-second download for people that may not even know what it is, have you stuck to it? Is it still ongoing? Um, yeah, it is. It's uh, I've not got the crack. I'm not, but I've not got the crack cocaine phone and the kale okay. phone. But uh, I'd say uh, the the just to give uh, illumination for people who might have heard of the idea before. Essentially, the idea is I call it the smartphone paradox, where um, the phone is the gateway to the world's best knowledge. Like you could search Richard Feynman. I remember one day I was like listening to Sean Paul, and I was going. Like the opportunity cost of me listening to Sean Paul is so high because I could be listening to any lecture series ever, but I'm sat there listening to Light Glue or Get Busy by get Sean busy, Paul. Yeah, but bro, yeah. how happy are you? It's, it's true. That's true. I'm joking. I'm kind of joking. Like music obviously is fucking great. But, you could flip um, that statement on his head too, George. The opportunity cost mean? of listening to lectures when you could be listening <laughs> to, <laughs> to, Sean listen to Sean Paul. <laughs> oh, both. Oh, both. Yeah. One F on each, mate. So, uh, but I had that realization that I, I, this is the, this is the beauty of the cocaine phone that I did want to point out that the alternative that was presented to all these distractions was well you just have a Nokia or you just give up on a phone which means you can't access Sean Paul or you can't access the craziness that does exist on these things and it was kind of settling life at either end of the barbell of well why not just have two phones rather than one phone I'm addicted to or one phone where I can't get Uber, or if mum is ill, I can't find out like about her. That's a problem. Um, two phones of Kale phone that I kind of just check in the morning and just has all the basics on there, like notes, Uber, Google Maps, alarms, Sean Paul, if I want to. Um, and then the cocaine phone, which is just the wild, wild west, like Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, <laughs> strip clubs, all, all, of, the, all, of, all of the above, right? Um, and having that split in my life has been incredibly useful. There's been times where I've lost my phone and then had to go back to it. There's been things like that. But on the whole, and if I occasionally have to download an app on this phone, I'm not like, again, it's, it goes back to what we are chatting about earlier with metrics, where if the actual routine of it becomes more unproductive than what it was before, well, then you've just created this kind of imaginary prison for yourself to live in. So I'm not so anal with it to a point of being absurd. But yeah, on the whole, I've like stuck with it. I use the kale phone to wake me up, put the cocaine one away. And then just when I want to go on that one, I'll go on that one. Amazing. I, I, these guys still got to do the test, but I have to say, that uh listen i'm not an advice guy and i hate hacks this one truly yeah, my reading has gone out of control like i am dusting books like i haven't in years like I'm, I'm probably reading a book a week now and and people are like oh Trump, why can't you do it on the kindle it's like like you said i want good internet access like uh, i don't need uh a iphone pro max but have you ever used a browser on the kindle it's the biggest piece of shit ever like it's not a good browser right the note taking on kindle awful Whereas you can have an iPhone 8, which is what I use, and I just have it, turn off all the color on it. It's black and white. I just fucking read on it, take notes. It's incredible, dude. Thank you. I, honestly, thank you. Total game changer for me, man. No, thank you. I mean, it was your your piece that then ended up getting picked up by Fox, which is how I ended up in the, like, the craziest, weird like scenario I've ever had in my You're entire life. You're on Fox. Life. You were talking about it, right? Incredible. Talk about remote work, which I about with Jackie earlier, which is like, I had like, obviously I was remote. I had like a blazer on the top. And then like Adidas sliders on the bottom, um, but yeah, it was a uh, it was a weird experience. But on the whole, it's the it's the one thing where so many people reached out and gone, that's a game changer. And I, I just think it's it's this weird bit in the middle that exists of phone being so damn useful. It's almost like somebody who has a cocaine problem, but it also makes it's kind of like maybe in a rock star where they make all their money being around that lifestyle. So it is this kind of inter like connected web where the phone isn't bad, but it's not good. And it's knowing like how to use it, when to use it. And I do think things like this will become more and more common. One criticism that I got, or two criticisms that I got from it was, one, why not just use screen time things or have discipline? It's like, it just doesn't work, does it? I've have never discipline, any... yeah, that, that works Dude, really come well. come on, bro, yeah. Place. Just use your discipline. Literally, just hit the password and you get another 15 minutes. That's me every day, yeah. like 30 times. Yeah, send me your screen time is what I say to those people because I bet it's absurd, right? So you have that criticism. And then the uh, the second one was then like almost like an environmentalist one of like, you're telling people to get more phones. But actually, there's, there's more smartphones now than people anyway. And this is only going to accelerate. So this idea of like, it's going to be a big burden on the environment is ludicrous as well. But I, I just try it. I think this idea of waking up first thing in the morning and get going through a stream of TikToks 
of this algorithm purely customized or whatever or like anything no, straight TikTok's into your generally positive man the the, the <laughs> uh, street Twitter fights and you. the fucking yeah, that's yeah. That's yeah. Stuff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah imagine that imagine you know tim ferris used to ask people about their morning routines imagine if that's like the answer i yeah, wake up, up i watch <laughs> Dr. Some of those are so bad. Really oh good cafeteria fights this morning. Oh my goodness! I Incredible. drink five cups of coffee on an empty stomach and watch road rage videos on uh, X. That's how I'm so oh dialed in. God. Insane, man. Well, George, dialed. we're gonna have to wrap it up soon. But one last thing we got to ask you about, which uh, I didn't plan to ask you about, but we got to bring it up here. I'm gonna share my screen for a minute because we talked about you being oh, English. Fuck. And we got these old school techers right here, mate. George was in an Adidas oh, commercial. Do you remember this? Uh, and you guys, dude. I mean, obviously you remember it, but I'm saying to these guys, uh, wait, let me just do that one. Let me make sure it's uh, showing the uh, once it optimized for video. Do we need audio? Is this what we need audio? No, you don't need audio. There we go. Incredible. Look at these techers here, mate. This is football's finest. Look at this freestyler. Look at this, man. You're in an Adidas commercial, yeah? Correct. Man, yeah. That or you had, dude, were you, did you take footy ser quite seriously? So there's a funny story about this and it kind of relates to uh, parenting that we spoke about earlier, which is um, my dad. I think it's the best parenting hack. I, I think when we spoke about parenting earlier, it's kind of the act, I assume, of taking what your parents did well, doing more of that, and then discarding what they did wrong, right? You're kind of forking Bitcoin into and hoping that you don't end up in Bitcoin cash, right? So I... I my the one thing my dad did extremely well was um i was always quite competitive and rather than him saying do this or do that he used to like bet me things he go i bet you can't do that and as a result it was a it was a psychological hack because if he said do that i'd be like no i'm not going to do that and if he's like don't do that then i would have done that but the fact he said oh i bet i could you can't do 10 kickups of a football i then like weird brain kind of kicked in and took went it so extreme. seriously that yeah <laughs> went extreme trained for like four hours a day after school it's all i would do don't have much memories of school because i was just doing this ended up in an adidas advert for the fifa world cup uh which is out there somewhere online and yeah became extremely what year extreme what year which world cup uh, it would have been the brazil world cup 2012 wow that's incredible when they lost to germany seven yeah. nothing it was the set that was the worst moment Classic ever for me one. as a as a bandwagon fan of every sport. That was the worst <laughs> moment. I was in Brazil for that, boys. That was pretty dark. <laughs> Jesus you, Christ! You told us right yeah, after the that was like, dark. That was that was rough. So when man. you say dark, you mean you don't remember much of it, or what? What does that Both, mean? Both, man. It was uh, like the somber attitude. I was on the on the beach in Rio. They get pounded seven nils. Like not the oh best. Oh my goodness, man. Yeah. Oh. That's one thing that doesn't exist in American culture. Going back to Brits Americans in Britain or and Brazil, everywhere soccer, you cannot have the fans near each other because it, it oh, is yeah, a war. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a it's a tribal war. It's like a like war people, zone. Literally, people yeah. will die. Like literally, people yeah. will die, and then they pay these security guys like minimum wage to kind of deal with it, which is terrible. Whereas in America, it seems like people on opposing teams can sit next to each other and just pat one another on the back. So like, God knows what it would have been like being a German in Brazil that night. Yeah, yeah not true. good. Well, I'm Twitter's sorry. the battlefield. Twitter X is the battlefield, people. But uh, George, uh, you're not gonna get the inbound like you did after Modern Wisdom. We're not quite at that level of uh, Chris uh, on the rankings. But uh, where can we send people that uh, have made it this far and laughed at every time I said anal print? Where can, where can we send them? <laughs> Analprint.com. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, not I am. first. First off, I disagree with that statement. I think what you guys have done is fantastic. Like I said, I've listened to you guys from the start. I think it's incredible. The balance of the personality is amazing. Um, in terms of finding out about myself, just go to george-mac.com or search George Mac on X. I'm sure you'll find me. Um, and yeah, DM's always open. Amazing. Guys. Incredible, mate. Thanks for coming marathon. on, mate. That was incredible. Ooh. Two hours, way, I think we went. That went, that went quick. Gone, Jack. Yeah, Blue all right. Bye. I was just yeah. checking that domain name for you, Tron, but it is unavailable. <laughs> Apple owns it. Apple yeah, owns it. Big Apple. Yeah. There we go. Big Apple. All right, guys. That was right, amazing. Great to man. have you on, mate. We'll have to do this again. We got like 15 other things. We'll uh, save that for part two. Cheers, mate. Yeah, whenever. Hit me up, boys, whenever. And um, pleasure listening to the podcast. Hopefully, nice. see you guys in person at some point as well. Oh, see you in a bit. Cheers. Yeah, nice one, mate. Thank you for doing this.